the right way for Ted Bundy to behave and make sure that people get the right impression. Am I going to jump up on the table? Am I going to scream? That's what I felt like doing. But I kept it together because there's no point in destroying myself. I have got to keep myself together. I have got to stay calm. I've got to keep my presence of mind. And that's the way I feel. Welcome to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. In the winter of 1974, women from the Pacific Northwest began to disappear. At first, the cases seemed random, but soon a pattern emerged. The missing women were all beautiful, young, and white. Families hoped for the best, but when the girls' remains were eventually discovered, authorities knew there was a killer on the loose. Among the thousands of tips, an unlikely suspect came into view. A handsome, well-liked and respected law student named Ted Bundy. And soon the world would know his chilling story. This is how it really happened. Women started going missing. Uh, in intervals of about once a month. They seemed to vanish without a trace. That was very frightening for women in the area at the time because there wasn't any sense to what was going on. When you're 18, you don't want to imagine the unimaginable. My sister Sue, um, <laughs> she was a blonde, blue-eyed, pretty girl. She had a great smile. Five foot two, 104 pounds. She was a little thing. But she was so bubbly and loving. She had such an inquisitive mind. A bookworm, but she loved people. I first met Sue in sixth or seventh grade. We were cheerleaders together. She was so happy uh, and excited to be going to college. We were ready to just get going, see what life was about and what it had to offer. She was where she wanted to be. And she was doing wonderful <laughs> at school. She had made friends. Her grades were exceptional. We would write letters back and forth. The last letter that she wrote me was that she had met someone new and she was very excited. That was the last time I heard from her. Sue's roommate called and said, Sue didn't come home last night. I said, what do you mean she didn't come home? The night that she disappeared, she had gone cross campus to a meeting for next year's dorm monitors. She had put her clothes in the dryer, and she never came back. Susan Rancourt, a straight-A biology major, didn't show up to meet some friends for a movie. She was gone, and they don't know what happened. And they started searching that night. Having a, a dear friend who was as sweet as could be go missing and possibly have harm come to her is something you don't even really want to think about. There was an extensive search by local police for days, but very few leads, no sign of Susan. Missing persons posters yielded no information. Susan had simply disappeared. Al Pickles, the chief of police, worked with us every day. Chief Pickles searched the dorms from top to bottom. He had notified other colleges in Washington State and nearby Oregon and Idaho. Then Chief Pickles started hearing of another girl missing here and one missing there and he really started digging into it to see what was going on. Linda Ann Healy, a 21-year-old University of Washington student, disappeared from her Seattle apartment in January of 1974. She went to the University of Washington. 
she had a announcing job at a radio station in uh, Seattle. She was on the radio every morning doing the ski report five days a week. When she did not come on the news and, and do her ski report, people noticed that she was gone. And then on March 12th, Donna Manson disappeared from uh, Evergreen State College in Olympia. She was walking across campus one minute, the next minute she's gone. There just was a kind of eerie erasure of these women. May 6th, the scene was repeated, this time miles south at Oregon State University in Corvallis. Kathy Parks disappeared while walking on campus that night. No trace was found. Three weeks later, the night of May 31st, 22 year old Brenda Ball left this Burian Tavern and vanished. Brenda Ball. We knew that she lived close by to the tavern that she was missing from. Basically, we had no witnesses. Nobody saw her with anybody. Then you had George Ann Hawkins disappear. The night of June 10th, 18 year old George Ann Hawkins left a fraternity to make this walk just 90 feet down a well lit alley back to her sorority at the University of Washington. George Ann was never seen again. She's gone. The state of anxiety in Washington can't be overstated. Jalen. of fear swept all across the state of Washington from January to July of 1974 when someone was abducting young women. It was difficult to connect the dots when you're talking about young women, similar age, somewhat similar description. Young, pretty white females, dark haired, typically parted down the middle. Who go missing with no, virtually no clues. It was very important to us to try and determine whether or not there was any connection among the cases. We didn't have anything coming our way. We had the fact that they were missing and the date and time that they were missing about, but nothing to help us with the investigation. Then, in July of 1974, King County Police started investigating two cases involving women who had gone missing from Lake Sammamish State Park. Lake Sammamish would change everything. Type of cases of missing person, date of occurrence is 7-14-74. Location of occurrence is Lake Sammamish State Park. Case status is open. There were different events going on at Lake Sammamish Park and thousands of people there with their families. The first person at the park that was missing was Janice Ott. She was seen on the beach in her bikini talking to a guy and they walked together and she wheeled her bicycle back toward the parking lot where his car was parked and that's the last that she was seen and then Denise Naslin was on the beach and she had to use the restroom so she walked back toward the restroom and was never seen again 19 year old Denise Naslin and 23 year old Janice Ott disappear on a warm summer day at Lake Sammamish police launched a massive search of the park though there was no sign of the women. Once the news media broadcast information about these two women going missing, witnesses came forward and the witnesses indicated that there were suspicious things. Authorities didn't know it at the time, but a girl who was only 15 years old it would prove to be the key eyewitness. The news came on and the news anchor held up two pictures of two women and started out by saying um, there's two missing women from Lake Sammamish and I looked at one of the pictures and it was Janice Ott and I really felt like I had a knot in my throat. I remember turning to my dad I said that girl was laying next to me on the beach and she left with this guy. He said well I'm gonna have to call the police department 
The very next day, Detective Keppel came to the house, and I explained the whole story to him. She turned out to be a pretty good witness. It was an absolute beautiful day. I'd say by, by noon, it was literally wall-to-wall -wall people on the beach. Sylvia told Detective Keppel that a smooth-talking stranger had come up to her and asked her for help. This guy came up. He was kind of tall, very tanned, very good-looking. He came up to me and asked me to help him put his sailboat onto his car. And I remember looking at him, and I, I told him, I said, you know, I, two of my girlfriends are up at the concession stand, and if I was gone, they would be really worried. Then this girl laying next to me sat up, and he asked her the exact same thing. And she says, well, I could probably help you with that. And she got up, she got dressed. As she was picking up her towel, she says, hi, my name's Jan. And he said, hi, I'm Ted. He said, my name's Ted. So that's the first time we had a name. And he asked me if I could give a description. The individual was probably about five foot ten, uh, with light brown hair, somewhat curly or wavy. Mid twenties, possibly a university student, dressed in white t-shirt, white shorts, white tennis shoes, white socks. And he was wearing uh, a sling, some sort of sling device on his arm. So that was the composite. Witnesses told of a smooth talking, good looking young man named Ted, who'd been seen talking with them. Police released a composite drawing and description of Ted. The newspaper put the composite out and I think the headline was, is this the Ted that took the girls? For two women, the composite sketch of Ted hit a little too close to home. My friend threw the picture on the table, the composite, and she said to me, who, is, who do you think that is? I said, well, it's Ted, why? And then she burst into tears because that looked a lot like her boyfriend, Ted Bundy. A lot like him. A lot of people trying to pin a lot of stuff on somebody because, uh, you know, it's convenient. She went to the authorities. I think she wanted to make sure he wasn't the one. In my own mind, there were similarities or coincidences that seemed to tie him in, but yet when I would think about our day-to-day -day relationship, there was nothing there that would lead me to think that he was a violent man. You ever physically harmed anyone? Ever physically harmed anyone? No. Bios. In July of 1974, eight young women had gone missing, and panic was rising because it became clear that they had not gone of their own volition. They had been taken. Authorities had very little to go on other than a few eyewitness accounts of a man who had been in the area. His name was Ted. And he was last seen with one of the women who'd gone missing at Lake Sammamish. And from that point on, it was like a heightened alert. We didn't have any physical evidence to go by. We had missing persons for months and no remains. Before the first dump site was found, they didn't have any evidence at all. The first remains were found just a few miles from Lake Sammamish State Park. Police made the grisly recovery of several bodies badly beaten, sometimes strangled. The skeletal remains of Janice Ott and Denise Nasland were found on a hillside. She was like a ray of sunshine in my life. She brought me so much happiness. And I don't believe I'll ever be the same again. The hunters came across bones. You didn't have an entire skeleton. You had just pieces, making it very difficult. Well, you could see in the skulls that were found that there were fracture marks. So that led us to believe that they were probably 
struck in the head. The bodies of four more young women were found. All of them had been strangled or bludgeoned by this brutal killer. Linda Ann Healy. Her body was found a mountain 18 miles from Seattle, along with the bodies of several other missing women, including 18-year-old Susan Rancourt. They found her body in the mountains. They couldn't identify her except by her dental records. That's horrific. When somebody's missing, you imagine the worst things. And it turns out what happened to her might have been worse than what we imagined. There were just very few leads, very few clues. It was not easy. There just wasn't any of the traditional things you would find at a murder scene. Clothing? Where was that? And where in the world was the rest of the remains? We didn't have that either. Only had bones. We still could not find evidence leading us to the offender. Like Sammamish with all those people there, they, they were telling the public, please send all your photographs of the crowds to us, please. And they did. And um, they never got a photo with him in it. They got a photo with what they believed might be his car. The witnesses that we had saw Ted leaving with Janice or with Denise and saw him heading towards this Volkswagen. Unfortunately, there was no license plate that we had. It was just a description of a car. And there were literally hundreds of Volkswagen Beetles in the state of Washington at the time. They were not in good shape. Here's what they knew about the abductor. People sitting around Janice, he said this guy identified himself as Ted. They had a description from which composite drawings came forth and they knew this person drove a Volkswagen. We received literally thousands of tips and interestingly, Ted Bundy was among them. Police released a composite drawing and description of Ted. And within weeks, through an anonymous call, the name of Tacoma native Ted Bundy was added to a file of more than 3,000 suspects being investigated by the police task force. People teased him at the office and said, say, your name's Ted and you've got a Volkswagen. And of course, they were teasing and laughing about it because he was the boy next door. He was handsome. He was charming. He, was a, he had political aspirations. He also happened to look a lot like the composite sketch. And he drove a Volkswagen similarities were enough to make his friends wonder. One of the articles in the paper said that he drove a bronze Volkswagen. We went to a payphone and I called and asked them for sure if it was a bronze and they said yes and that was a relief because Ted's Volkswagen was tan. Mary Lynn met Ted in 1969 at the Sandpiper Inn. It was a tavern in Seattle and they soon became fast friends because he was dating her best friend Liz Kendall. We did lots of things together. There was kind of the three of us. I came and went along for the ride, you know. I feel good about myself. I'm happy with myself. And they know that I didn't do these things. Ted was born in a home for unwed mothers in Vermont in 1946. Bundy's mother, she was a single mother. And shortly after that, she moved as far away as she could, moved to the West Coast. She met and married a man named Johnny Bundy, who was a cook in an army hospital. Johnny was very self-effacing and did not make a distinct impression. Louise did. Ted looked exactly like his mother. Ted being the oldest. And uh, you might say my pride and joy. Our relationship was always very special. He was a very normal, active boy. He uh, was, did all the things that most boys <laughs> like to do. He graduated high school, 65, with about a B. He started fall University of Puget Sound. He was smart, and I think, um, and he always got good grades. We had wonderful discussions. You know, I love talking to Ted because he's great, talks about politics, very well read, very analytical, all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, he liked him. He had a bachelor's degree in psychology. He had worked in some campaigns. People liked him. He had pretty good street cred in, in some pretty legitimate circles. Ann Rule, who later wrote a book about Ted, had worked with him in a suicide prevention line. She was impressed with him. 
Ted was my partner at the crisis clinic right. for a little over a year. And I liked him. He was so good on the phones. Uh, he'd walk me to my car and say, Ann, lock your doors because I don't want anything to happen to you on the way home. Lots of people in the political world thought he had a future. He'd work for Governor Dan Evans in, the, in the, his re-election campaign. When Dan Evans was elected, he and my friend went to the governor's ball. And I, re I recall her saying, I felt like I was in a dream because we danced. The, you know, the governor and his wife danced the first and then we danced the dream. Yeah, it was wonderful. He had a lot of influential people that liked him and believed in him. He had enrolled in the University uh, of Utah School of Law. He was making a name for himself. It can't be, can't be our Ted because we know him. Ted Bundy, a rising star in the state Republican Party, was not considered a prime suspect. Those Washington cases remain open. By September of 1974, the murders in Washington state had stopped. But a little over 800 miles away, near Salt Lake City, Utah, women began going missing. And this was very near where Ted Bundy attended law school. Welcome back to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. In 1975, terror and panic gripped the nation after eight missing women had been found brutally murdered in Washington state. Detectives had a suspect, Ted Bundy, but had no evidence tying him to the crimes. Then, women began going missing near Salt Lake City, Utah, close to where Bundy was attending law school. And authorities began to wonder, could this be the work of the same man? Here in the West, there are still unanswered questions in a number of murder cases. Unsolved crimes frustrate police. I was working late at KSL and the front desk called up to the newsroom and said, there's a police chief here that wants to talk to a reporter. It was Chief Lewis Smith with the Midvale Police. He had a photo with him and said, uh, this is my daughter, Melissa, and I think she's been abducted. I want to know that, that the young girls are safe on the street. I don't want another parent to go through what my wife and I went through. I don't, I don't think that's right. Melissa left her father on the night of October 18, 1974 to meet a friend at this Midvale restaurant. They talked for a while and then Melissa left. She said for home, but she never got there. She walked home. It wasn't well, well lighted. And a lady, she hears a single scream pierce the night air. Three weeks later, Debbie Kent went missing from a school auditorium when she left a school play early. Debbie was attending a play with her family at Viewmont High School on the night of November 8, 1974. She left the play early to pick up her brother at an ice rink. And the mom said, you know, be careful, hurry back, Deb. And uh, she got up and she walked out the doors on the western side. We're at the Kent home in Bountiful right now. What you're looking at is the porch light that's been left on for Debbie. A beacon of light, a symbol of hope. By year's end, four Utah women would be missing and feared dead. And just like in the state of Washington, detectives were really just hankering for clues as to who could be responsible for all of these missing women. But then police caught a break in the form of a young woman named Carol Durange who came to them with an almost unbelievable story of escaping the horror of being kidnapped by a really good-looking man who drove a Volkswagen. And that story would be key to solving this case. She was at a, a mall. He approaches her. He went up and he says, I'm a police officer and I think someone's broken in your car. Do you have a... Camaro and she says yes and he says would you come with me you can come with me in you know my car so she sees this ratty little Volkswagen he gets her in his uh, Volkswagen he's driving off gets a few blocks away he pulled his Volkswagen over and within a second of having stopped the vehicle he attacked her he tries to slap the handcuffs on her he had gotten the handcuff on one arm, was trying to get the handcuff on the other wrist. 
missed it. Got it on the same arm. Well, she knew if she was going to survive this, she had to get out of that car. She got out and got out of the vehicle, tried to chase her, but there were headlights coming towards them. He just knew he couldn't stay there. He got back in his car and left. Carol Durant told her story to the police, and now they had insight into the suspect's M.O. He would try to lure women into his car, and they would never be seen again. This began to match what the Washington State Police were hearing, and it all began to come together. He was very big on using the ruse of a helpless person. At Lake Sammamish, he had an arm cast. He said to two of the girls, could you please come and help me load a sailboat on my car? Calling them over to a car for a helping hand, which you would normally go ahead and do if you were trusting. At Central Washington State College, where he abducted Susan Rancourt, he did a similar thing. Two young women at Sue's College had been approached by him before. Sue, one of the young ladies, carried his books to the car. He had brown, light brown, and kind of shaggy hair. I noticed that he had a sling on one arm. When he would get him in his vehicle, he would uh, try to knock him out at that point. Then molest him, kill him, or kill him and rape him after. Those people would never, you know, be seen again. Sue, she wasn't out looking for trouble when she was taken. He asked for help and she would have helped him. Being helpful was her downfall. So now they had an M.O., but no person of interest. And it would be the work of an astute highway patrolman who would finally bring this depraved suspect into the light. It was late at night, about two in the morning, and he had stopped at this little residential area. What happened is a highway patrolman uh, saw his uh, the vehicle, thought it was suspicious, pulled him over. It was early in the morning, I exited my car, and the officer, Hayward, uh, had left his car and approached me. He searches his car and he finds a ski mask and uh, some rope and an ice pick and a pair of handcuffs. They knew that somebody was out there that was, you know, driving the Volkswagen that this Carol Laurent escaped from and with the handcuffs, he said, oh, well, I'll have to check into this guy. The man now in custody was Ted Bundy. In October of 75, Ted Bundy was identified in a police lineup after being arrested on kidnapping charges in Salt Lake City. He was a law student. He was the kind of a rising star. So the idea that somebody like this was the possible perpetrator, it's impossible. When it was first identified that it might be Ted Bundy, it was just total disbelief. None of us that had any remote connection with Ted could possibly believe. And yet as time went by, we realized there was more truth than there was suspicion. Complete and utter shock. We we still don't believe it. Just just can't be. Our son is the best son in the world. I'm going to do my best to uh, keep in touch with friends and family who've been so kind and been so good in writing and praying for me, and I'm thankful for that. In October of 1975, Ted Bundy was charged with the aggravated kidnapping of Carol Durant the young woman he had tried to handcuff inside of his Volkswagen. While investigators were building the case, Ted's friends and family were in complete disbelief. The first reports were when he was uh, arrested in Salt Lake City. It was quite a shock when we realized it, in fact, was the same Ted Bundy. The Ted Bundy we knew was not a violent person. On the other hand, there were some people whom we interviewed who knew Ted that put all the things together and said, you know, he was one strange duck. They just thought there was something odd about him. 
It wasn't just his behavior that was seemingly odd. It was his ever-changing appearance. I remember distinctly when they did him in a lineup, and Ted had longer hair, curly. Well, when he went up to do the lineup, he'd cut his hair very short, so he'd look like everybody else. It was not only cut, but it was parted on the other side, which would create this kind of different symmetry of the face. He looked like a chameleon. He was very much different each time somebody saw him. I guess when I started putting things together, I had spoken to my father here in Utah because I was getting worried and his words were, Mary Lynn, if he's the one, he'll do it again. Once he was arrested and his name became associated and the cops started speaking to each other, people by then were convinced that Bundy had committed these crimes in Washington. People had reported that they thought he looked like the composite, he had a Volkswagen bug, he had left the area in 1974 after Lake Sammamish and gone to Utah. So that was a clue also because the killings, abductions, missing people cases had stopped around the time he left the state. I mean, he fit all the parameters. And everybody's scales fell off their eyes at once and it was simply, this is the guy, it's Bundy. We just now have to prove it. I'm not guilty. <laughs> does, that, does that include the time I stole a comic book when I was five years old? <laughs> I'm not guilty of the charges which filed against me. Despite the fact that he was a suspect in multiple murders, Ted was actually legally just facing one count of aggravated kidnapping. And he was given the possibility of bail, and he posted bail, and returned to Washington State before his trial in Utah. Ted was allowed to come back for the Christmas holiday. Ted knew that people were watching him. And he was infamous, really, at that point. His visit put both authorities and his girlfriend's best friend, Mary Lynn, on edge. Especially when Mary Lynn found herself in Ted's company at Liz's house and then alone with him in his car. I know by now that they're investigating him and I remember we were over at her house having dinner and I had to go home and she said, come on, I'll take you home. And, I, and Ted jumped and said, no, let me take her, let me take her. And he ended up taking me home. I could have gotten an Academy Award for the performance I put in in that car because I just talked to him like things were normal. I didn't want to be around him. In the new year, Ted returned to Utah to face the trial for the aggravated kidnapping of Carol Durant, a former law student. He had a lot of confidence and he decided he was going to help defend himself. Putting yourself in a position of being your own counsel, it's that positive psychology. You're going to do it. You're going to do it because you're right. Obviously, I'm going to bear the consequences, so why not bear the responsibility? I covered the trial from uh, beginning to end. They had a, a good case against him for the kidnapping, not a really great case. There wasn't a lot of evidence. They found the head hair of Carol Durant in his car. There was the eyewitness accounts of Carol. She was obviously the key witness in the case, but she wasn't the best witness because her story was not really consistent. At one point she said, well, I don't know if the police badge that he showed me was silver or gold. These are minor details. She was adamant that he was the man. After a killing spree that spanned the U.S., justice was about to be served. You're going to represent yourself or you're going to get another attorney? I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. Was the trial a way for Bundy to relive his crimes? I just prayed that I would be calm, knowing he would take some kind of pleasure in scaring us. How It Really Happened with Hill Harper, Sunday at 8 on HLN. Every uh, citizen who believes in law and order should spend a couple weeks there and, and learn how it works. Everybody knew about Ted Bundy. He uh, had attempted to kidnap Carol Durant, and uh, she got away. On March 1st, 1976, Ted Bundy was found guilty of aggravated kidnapping. <laughs> it's an emotional time. I don't even like to think of that day. But I wasn't going to give them satisfaction seeing me break down. Ted was then sent to Utah State Prison for a 90-day psychiatric evaluation before his sentencing. 
and the psychologist would be charged with the task of determining whether this event was just a one-time thing or whether he was a predator who should be locked up forever. I was a psychologist at the prison and this person is walking towards me and a smile on his face and he extends out his hand and he says, I'm Ted Bundy, you must be Dr. Carlisle. He had the ability to make a very good impression. He looked good, he smiled, he uh, seemed confident, he seemed happy. He gave me the Ted Bundy he wanted me to know. Over the next 90 days, Dr. Carlisle would delve into Ted's psyche by trying to cover every aspect of his life from his early childhood up into his teenage years when he became a prolific consumer of pornography. Ted is lonely and he's just not fitting in. He would just sort of withdraw and being lonely and not fitting in, you have to get your satisfaction somewhere. He withdrew into a quiet fantasy life, but then his behavior would begin to escalate. He was getting interested in window peeking and pornography, and he's feeling a sense of control, a sense of power, so they rely upon it more and more and more. Dr. Carlisle focused a lot on Ted's relationships with women, but one woman in particular, her name was Marjorie, and she, by all accounts, was Ted's dream girl. She was very intelligent. She was outgoing. She had worked part-time as a model. She had money, she had prestige. Ted felt like he'd been, you know, left outside of that circle of privilege and pursued her. They communicate back and forth. And uh, then she told him, I just want to be friends. A lot of experts believe that Ted Bundy had a huge issue with rejection. And that that rejection, the breakup with Marjorie, was a watershed event that he would never get over. He's very disappointed. It's as though Marge was the last ditch attempt to get control over his wild life. And so the dark side then just sort of shifts in. Based on all of the evidence that Dr. Carlisle was able to gather from his interviews with Ted and all of his friends and family, he came to the conclusion that Ted Bundy was indeed a very violent man and that he was most likely responsible for all of these crimes that he was being considered for. After we finished, he says, Al, do you think I really killed those girls that they claim I did? And part of me wanted to say, yes, I have no doubt about it. But what I said was, I don't know for sure, but I think if you did, you'll likely do it again. And at that point, he didn't say anything. He just walked off down the hall, went back to his cell. As each day went on, there was more information that came in about Ted. Eyewitness reports fitted with Bundy's description. There was also physical evidence in Bundy's car. They had seized the Volkswagen and vacuumed the inside for evidence. There were, uh, I believe, pubic hair of other women, young women, in the car which would have been the first really strong sort of smoking gun link to link him to these other killings. Ted's not the person we thought he was. They've got real evidence against him. Being in prison, going through a kind of hell, matures a person, and I, and I think it's, it's done good things for me. My only misgiving is that I might never be, might never be in a position to apply it, you know, on the streets where I'd like to apply it. He was looking for avenues of escape. Bundy, who had been awaiting... I'd like to apply. Welcome to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. In the early 1970s, terror gripped the United States when young women began disappearing. They were
were later found murdered, brutally beaten, and sexually assaulted. The main suspect in the crime seemed an unlikely one, a handsome, charming law student named Ted Bundy. When he was taken into custody on kidnapping charges, authorities and the public breathed a collective sigh of relief. But this was not the end of the Bundy story. Not even close. Here's how it really happened. From Washington State to Oregon to Utah, police have discovered a pattern of rape murders. Women started going missing. Their bodies found much later time on deserted roads in the forest. Linda Ann Healy, Denise Naslin, Janice Ann Ott, George Ann Hawkins, and 18-year-old Susan Rancourt. We were both sobbing. And I said to my husband, I'll never see her again. And we didn't have evidence. We didn't have clues. Lake Sammamish would change everything. This guy came up, and he was kind of tall, very tanned, very good looking. And he said, hi, I'm Ted. So that's the first time we had a name. And they knew this person drove a Volkswagen. The newspaper put the composite out, and my friend, she threw the picture on the table. And she said to me, who, is, who do you think that is? I said, well, it's Ted, why? And then she burst into tears because that would look a lot like her boyfriend, Ted Bundy. Theodore Robert Bundy, at age 25, a Republican campaign worker in Seattle. At 28, a University of Utah law student. He didn't look like a murderer. He was nice looking. He was educated. If he was in this room right now, you would feel very comfortable, very comfortable with him. He just didn't present any type of a threatening persona to you. And that was, that was his strength. It was that deception. In a Salt Lake City trial, Bundy was convicted of trying to kidnap Carol Durant from a shopping center in Murray. She managed to escape from his Volkswagen and testified against him at the trial. All throughout this, Ted was saying, I'm innocent. I'm no fool. I don't like being locked up, and I don't think any man does. It was a Utah where Bundy was pulled out of the shadows. As each day went on, there was more information that came in about Ted. Eyewitness reports headed with Bundy's description. There was also physical evidence in Bundy's car, strong enough for Bundy to become the prime suspect in the baffling series of crimes. Because of the notoriety he got nationally, all these various states started connecting their the dots together, and Bundy was there. Investigators in Vail, Grand Junction, and Aspen have open murder cases that they believe Ted Bundy can solve. For instance, 26-year-old Julie Cunningham, a Vail ski instructor, disappeared in March of 1975. Police have a credit card receipt that tells them Ted Bundy bought gas in that area on that same day. Denise Oliverson disappeared from Grand Junction in April of 1975. Police can also prove that Ted Bundy was in that area at that time. In 1976, Ted Bundy was extradited from Utah to Colorado to face charges for the very first time of first-degree murder. The victim was Karen Campbell. She was a nurse on vacation with her fiancé and his children. She was last seen getting onto a crowded elevator in her hotel. And they know that she got off on her floor, but she never made it to her room. Theodore Bundy is in Colorado tonight, where he will stand trial for first-degree murder. It was thought Bundy would fight extradition, but this morning he told a Utah judge he was ready to go to Colorado. Ted Bundy once again decided to act in his own defense. And the freedom this gave him played right into his plan. I had to go to the library. <laughs> it's a 50-yard walk from here across, this, across the parking lot to the library. That's my first issue. My class is graduating in about a month. In law school? Uh, I'll, I'll bet you I know more about law than you any of them. There was already a trial going on there. It was one of the first celebrity trials of its kind. The French actress Claudine Langer was charged with shooting her boyfriend, the world champion skier Spider Savage, to death. And the circus atmosphere provided a wonderful distraction for Ted Bundy. He was looking for avenues of escape. Do you ever feel like you'd like to escape? <laughs> I've dreamed about flying over those fences. I've dreamed about climbing over those fences and tunneling under those fences. With every other man in there, I've dreamed about being free. 
Because he was acting as his own attorney, he was given access to the library, which is on the second floor. They used to keep that window open. Nice, fresh air coming in. Guards started trusting him. Even after he was associated with all these crimes, and even after he'd been convicted in the Durant case, charm was his first default mode. Ted Bundy petitioned and won a motion that he wanted to be unshackled in court. So, in June 7th, 1977, Ted Bundy went to court and was allowed to be unshackled and go to the law library during a recess. It was there that he escaped. A woman walked into the courthouse and she said, is, the, is it common for people to jump out the second floor window of the courthouse? He was charismatic and they trusted him. They let him go in the library and he jumped out of the building. Bundy was alone inside when he decided to open that window and jump to 25 feet to the ground. In fact, you can still see the indentations in the grass here where he landed. Took off and got into the wilds of Colorado. We covered the escape after the fact. Roadblocks were set up within 15 minutes of Bundy's escape, and 150 men and five bloodhounds combed the canyons around Aspen. So far, these roadblocks have turned up no sign of Ted Bundy. They didn't take security all that seriously, and Bundy was, by all accounts, really smart, very clever. He wandered around, lost a lot of weight, was confused, ended up coming back into Aspen and uh, sold a car. A couple of patrol officers saw what they thought was a drunk driver. And they discovered two things. One, the person is not drunk, and two, Ted Bundy was back in Aspen. So he was rearrested that night. The streets of Aspen are safe again. Suspected multiple murderer Theodore Bundy is back in custody after an absence of nearly seven days. After he was caught, authorities were a lot more careful with Ted, but they still allowed him a lot more freedom than the other prisoners got. What the authorities didn't realize is that he was planning another escape. He was in shackles, and they didn't keep him in shackles when he was put back in his cell. There was a light fixture that was not that large, but large enough. And it was due to be welded, but it hadn't been. Bundy lost some weight. The prisoners were coming to the authorities saying, listen, Bundy is getting up in the ceiling and like crawling in the above rafter area. We hear him crawling back and forth at night and going back into a cell. They didn't do anything about it. That is just astounding stuff. He did everything he could to avoid detection. He takes his books and stuff and he forms a what is like a body, covers it. He had already said he didn't feel well, so they let him sleep. He gets uh, up in the rafters and down into a jailer's apartment. The jailer had gone out for a movie, gets some of his clothes, puts them on, goes out into the night and freed him once again. Bundy, who had been awaiting trial near Aspen, Colorado, escaped from a Colorado jail on December 31, 1977. Ted Bundy was gone, and the authorities did not know where he went. Theodore Bundy is now one of the FBI's most wanted men. I woke up to being attacked. It was early in the morning of January 15, 1978, that a killer walked into this Chi Omega sorority house at Florida State University and strangled two young co-eds to death, beat two others with a club, and then struck again. The next thing I remember, I was in the hospital. A federal warrant was issued on January 5, 1978, at Denver, Colorado charging Bundy with unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for the crime of murder. When Ted escaped, we did not believe he would come back to Washington because he was too well known in Washington State. He would want to get to the furthest place away from Washington State as he could get. My clock radio went off early that Super Bowl Sunday morning. It was a national newscast saying four sorority girls had been attacked at Florida State. A killer walked into this Chi Omega sorority house. I got a call from the sheriff, Ken Casares, wanted me to meet him at the Chi Omega sorority house. We have possibly 
three or four deaths. We were all shocked at what occurred. It was a Saturday night. We'd all just returned from Christmas break. It was, for all intents and purposes, a time to get reacquainted after being gone for several weeks. I had gone around six to um, a social at our little community church. Left about 10 and went back to Cayo, went to my room, did some reading, just kind of relaxed, and then went to bed probably about 11.30 or 12. My daddy called and told me that my mother was sick. She had the flu and would I come over and cook dinner? And my dad wanted me to spend the night, but I had a project due on Monday. So I went back to the story house. I had dance rehearsal that day. That evening I had a date, a first time date, and then I went home and I went to bed and that's the evening that it happened. During the pre-dawn hours of January 15th, the killer walked through an unlocked door at the Chi Omega sorority house and brutally beat four FSU co-eds as they slept. We would believe he had entered through an unlocked door on the first floor of the Chi Omega sorority house. Two of the girls, 20-year-old Lisa Levy and 21-year-old Margaret Bowman, died from their injuries. He had gone up the back stairs and the first room he would have encountered would have been the room occupied by Margaret Bowman. He entered that room, struck her, rendered her unconscious, and then he uh, strangled her with a, a pair of pantyhose. He exited her room, would have turned to the right, walked down the hallway maybe five or six feet. That would have been the room of Lisa Levy. Strikes her, renders her un unconscious, and then he strangles her manually, left her room, turned to his right, then to his left, and walked into the room occupied by two more co-eds. He attacked Margaret and Lisa, and then came into our room. And I, I don't think he was expecting two of us in the room. I woke up to being attacked. I was numb and being hit. When the light shone in, I remember seeing a shadow. I saw him attacking Karen, my roommate. Struck her across the face. Uh, he then left the uh, left the Comics Road House, walking downstairs, and he disappeared into the night. The young woman who'd been assaulted started screaming, of course, and that's the beginning of the story where police were called, the ambulance was called. I immediately went to Lisa's room. She was not conscious, but she was still very much alive. An EMT came right behind me and grabbed me by the shoulders and pulled me away so that they could do what they needed to do. I did not see Karen until the ambulance um, uh, drivers were taking her out. I just remember little flashes of things, being put into the ambulance and just asking how Kathy was. Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner remember being taken to the hospital in severe shock. I remember the cold and going into the ambulance and it's like something I won't forget. Yeah, a police officer wanted me to escort him to various rooms in the house to see if an intruder was uh, still in the house. But the killer wasn't done. While all these police officers are all over this area, we got a report of loud noises four and a half, five blocks away. I sent an investigator and found that we had another victim who had been brutally beaten. A short time later, the killer struck again, where he severely injured Cheryl Ann Thomas. I had a very severe head injury. I was unconscious or semi-conscious. I had two neighbors. They heard pounding kind of sound and they heard moaning and it frightened them so much that they decided to call the police. I knew this person had to be caught. We had someone who was more than dangerous. We've got a person on a rage. Everyone was very nervous, just on pins and needles. She saw the man walking down the stairway. There was blood everywhere. They were calling him a, a raging animal. I woke up and I, I knew I was in a hospital. My family was there 
and there was kind of a lull in the conversation and I said well why don't we turn on the TV and my father said well before we do there's something I need to tell you and that's how I learned what had happened. Two Florida State sorority sisters were strangled to death and three others brutally beaten with a club the morning of January 15th 1978. Someone had come into the Cayo and attacked two of my sorority sisters, attacked me and Karen and then left the sorority. The women who were murdered were 21-year-old Margaret Bowman and 20-year-old Lisa Levy. My family has lived with horror, sorrow, and pain. It's an emotional pain so deep it becomes physical. Margaret was perhaps our most stylish sister. Vivacious had a lot of personality. Lisa was just a ball of fire, just a lot of fun, a lot of energy, and I just loved her instantly. They were outstanding women outstanding young women with a huge life in front of them. Police were baffled, calling it the work of a deranged murderer. They were calling him a, a raging animal because of the way he'd gone down the, around the corner and attacked another woman in a duplex. He had pushed a chair under my front door, so they had to kick it in to be able to go in, and then that's where they found me in my bedroom. I couldn't imagine why it had happened or who had done it. None of the three surviving girls remember their attacker, and no one has been charged with the murders. Everyone was very nervous. There was a run on every hardware store in town. People were buying deadbolts, they were buying chains. Nobody knew what had happened, who had done it. Many of us were not allowed to attend the funeral, thinking that the assailant might be in those services. There was a haunting scene that I remember vividly of a young woman looking out, looking distraught at the Cayo house with the curtains kind of drawn around her. It was just sad, a real, a real, a real tragedy. It's been four days since the FSU murders occurred. Well over 200 calls a day are coming into the Coed Murder Command Center set up by police, but so far they have no definite leads. Law enforcement was working in the dark. They were conducting neighborhood by neighborhood canvassing, trying to locate suspects. They were also asking the public to call in if they saw any suspicious persons. I was being questioned by the police, do you know anybody that would ever want to hurt you in that way? They um, came and tried to hypnotize me. Where I was, what I did, did I see anybody? Did I see anyone outside? Did I see any cars outside that I remembered? They were hoping I would remember something. They were trying anything they could. The reward is now up to $10,000, and the mood, both on campus and here in this usually peaceful city, is still one of apprehension. We weren't allowed back in the house for the first week or so, and they were collecting evidence and fingerprint material. After I left the hospital, I had to go back to my room at the sorority house. There was blood everywhere. And they wanted me to look in the room and see if I was missing anything. Sometimes mass murderers will take a souvenir so I guess they were hoping if they caught the person that they would find some of those that they might be able to identify. Florida Department of Criminal Law Enforcement crime lab experts are still busy sifting through and analyzing evidence that was collected from the Chi Omega house. You're looking for any, any evidence, any debris uh, that is found, or you're looking for the kind of uh, murder weapon that may have been involved. We wanted to know what kind of weapon was used. We found bark looked like sawdust taken from the scalp of one of the young ladies that had been killed probably firewood by within the Kyomega house to use as a bludgeon the speculation well, no real was speculation that he probably picked up some a, a, a branch from some firewood now if we had found that limb we would have found blood we would have found hair we would have found tissues but it was never it was never found probably he discarded that piece of wood on a wood pile and very well it was consumed as a part of a fire in one of the sorority or fraternity houses. Details trickled out. Few and far between, but details trickled out. One of the sorority sisters came home late when she saw the man walking down the stairway kind of looking as he was coming down but did not see her. It's dark. He's got a uh, hat on down over his ears. That was basically it. The fear from people were very, very panicked. They were looking for someone to be arrested, and there was tremendous pressure on law enforcement to, to get something done. 
The Chi Omega killings made national news. The investigators in Washington state thought this had to be the work of Ted Bundy. He was still their prime suspect in the murders of several college-age women in 1974. Bundy was a psychology major at the University of Washington before starting law school in September 1974 in Utah. The 31-year-old Tacoma man is still the center of great interest here in King County. We were very much focused on the killings in Florida because we felt that there was a strong possibility that it was Ted and we figured that he would go to another place with universities and colleges where he could blend in because he always was able to blend in and draw no suspicion toward himself. You understand, Bundy never operated east of the Mississippi. He was one of, you know, literally hundreds of possible suspects. Little did they know, Ted Bundy had been living here, walking around this college campus and remaining very undercover. On February 9th, about 100 miles east of Tallahassee, a middle school student had gone missing. Kim Leakes was only 12 years old when she was abducted from her school. It was an aha moment that, okay, these may be connected. Believe me, I've grown in the past year, and I've learned a lot of things about myself in the past year. Sure, I get angry. Uh, I get very, very angry and indignant. I like being treated like an animal, and I like, like people walking around and ogling me like I'm some sort of weirdo, because I'm not. Welcome back to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. The brutal attacks on five women at Florida State University shocked the nation. Two women were dead and three others badly beaten. Authorities in Tallahassee were searching for any clue that could lead them to the killer. But a month after the attacks, they were still coming up empty. Then, 200 miles away, a simple traffic stop would bring a potential suspect into focus. I was patrolling west side of town, and uh, it was noted that it was a suspicious, suspicious vehicle behind the building. A police officer observed the Volkswagen. As a matter of routine, I was running the check on the tag when it did come back as a stolen vehicle. The car came back stolen from Tallahassee. At uh, this time, uh, the traffic stop was made, and when I was placing the handcuffs on him, he kicked my feet out from under me and struck me with uh, a handcuff that had been placed on one wrist. And of course, knocked me off my feet, and uh, that's when it started. When the officer got to him, he jumped up, started fighting the officer, and the officer overpowered him, took him into custody. When he was arrested shortly after midnight on Wednesday, he was just considered a belligerent speeder. He first identified himself as an FSU graduate student. Late Thursday, however, a bizarre story began unfolding. They had found somebody that they thought might be connected, but they didn't know who it was. He gave a name. The name was an athlete that was well known at Florida State University. He identified himself as that person and actually looked a little bit like him. As a result of that, of course, it was put out that this star athlete from Florida State was arrested in Pensacola. Whereupon we hear from him and says, I, I'm not in Pensacola. I don't know who it is you got out there. It's not me. We now knew that we weren't dealing with the person we thought. Who is this man? He refused to give his name to authorities and then told his arresting officer that he would probably get a promotion for nabbing him. Police now had an unknown person in custody and they were calling him the mystery man in the Pensacola prison. And then they ran his fingerprints. At the time, fingerprints were much slower than they are now. They had to be taken, they had to be submitted, they had to be cross-referenced by the FBI. It was a slower paper process. Today, that would be instantly done. Only late last night, following FBI fingerprint identification, did Pensacola police learn they had captured one of the most wanted, and according to the FBI, most dangerous criminals in the country, Theodore Robert Bundy. 31 years of age, convicted kidnapper, escapee from prison, suspected murderer, killings in Colorado, Utah, Oregon, and Washington. And now he is being questioned in connection with two murders at a sorority house at Florida State University in Tallahassee. Those murders occurred just 15 days after Bundy's New Year's Eve escape from Colorado. He was really under the radar, and nobody recognized him in Florida. The night his identity was revealed, Ted called his girlfriend Liz Kendall, and she recounted that telephone conversation with the Washington State investigators. 
Would you begin on February 16, 78, today, and describe the telephone call that you received from Ted Bundy? Uh, he called Collect. My daughter accepted the charges on it, and he said that he was in custody. And I asked him where, and he said Florida. He repeated over and over again that this was really going to be bad when it broke. It's that brick in the face moment where you're like, God, I've been so wrong about him. I think what shocked everybody was he was the mysterious stranger. He was not a grotesque human being. He was charming, in fact. And that was big news. Bundy was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, and it was learned he was wanted for questioning in as many as 36 sex murders. Authorities also say they can place Bundy in Tallahassee in January. Bundy was living right up the street on College Avenue. Not too far from the university. Not too far from Chi Omega. Bundy lived in this rooming house located less than a mile from the Chi Omega sorority. I interviewed all the people that lived in the doors next to him in the rooming house at the Oaks, and no one had anything bad to say of him. No one said they heard anything weird. He seemed uh, very calm, and uh, we had no reason to uh, suspect that he could have done anything. He was polite, but very soft spoken. He was a man of um, few words. You really had to say something to him to get a response. He looked very familiar to me. I swear it must have been him riding a bike by my house that I would see coming and going to my car, going to classes. I worked in the law library, and he had attended classes so frequently that many of the professors thought he was an actually enrolled student. Theodore Bundy has become a prime suspect in the Chi Omega sorority house murders. Ted Bundy's arrest made headlines, and it caught the eye of several people in Lake City, Florida, about 100 miles east of Tallahassee. There, on February 9th, a middle school student named Kimberly Leach had gone missing. Kim Leach was only 12 years old when she was abducted from her school. It was an aha moment that, okay, these may be connected. And all we gotta do now is prove this is the guy. It's Bundy. Security is extremely tight here at the Pensacola City Jail. On the second floor of this building, Ted Bundy is under constant guard. We heard that he had been arrested and that he was under suspicion for the murders and, um, and the assault on Cheryl. He became a prime suspect after he was arrested in Pensacola, driving a stolen Tallahassee car and carrying 21 stolen credit cards, many of which belonged to FSU co-eds. There was still this apprehension of, is this the right person? The ages and appearances of these women was very similar to Ted Bundy's other alleged victims, but the crime itself was different. It just wasn't his typical M.O. Ted's M.O. was to abduct young women by getting them to accompany him to a vehicle. That's completely different from what happened at the Kyle Omega house. We didn't have any evidence that this person, Ted Bundy, actually went into a home and killed and left the bodies. There's still a lot of evidence yet to be evaluated and there's no link yet between he or the murder scenes. And then Kimberly Leach was abducted from her junior high school there in Lake City. We obviously now had a different set of circumstances again. My wife had just given birth to our third child, and I was headed to the hospital to visit. And I heard on the radio an announcement that a little girl had disappeared from Lake City Junior High. February 9th, Kimberly Leach left Lake City Junior High for the last time. She was a pretty little 12-year-old girl who had just been elected to the uh, Valentine Court at her school. And on the very afternoon she got kidnapped, was going to go pick out a ball gown to wear to the towel. Patty Kalish, a classmate, was one of the last people to see Kim Leach alive watching as she went out the school's back door to the gym where Kim had left her purse. But instead of taking the short route, Kim went around to the front where she was abducted. To actually have a 12-year-old child taken from our community, just grabbed her up and took her away, it was just shock and disbelief. You can't imagine anything more disquieting for a small, uh, sleepy community like Lake City, Florida. It was very traumatic. and caused a massive manhunt. 
they turned every stone possible to in, in hopes of finding her. When the connection was made that uh, Bundy had been in Lake City the night before Kim went missing, and it was kind of like throwing a bloody hind quarter into a tank of sharks. Two and two it added up to four, and, and Ted looked like he could be our guy. He always would involve several different law enforcement jurisdictions in a crime where he picked the girl up where he would abandon her where he would kill her where he would you know bury them he really made a lot of confusion uh, and they weren't found until the evidence was no longer available as a plan of a murder he didn't leave any stone unturned it was like it was like choreographed so he was very difficult to track down i sent investigators over to to talk to him they were hoping for a confession they were interrogating him i got a call said that he's very distraught it looks like he's on the verge of confessing shortly after that he pulled himself together and i'll tell you as long as they attempt to keep their heads in the sand about me there's going to be people turning up in canyons because the police there aren't willing to accept what i think they know and they know that i didn't do these things he was a manipulator of a superior kind. He started playing games with these investigators. They were like pawns that he would move around. He would tell them, I'm not going to talk during the daytime. Okay. I said, well, talk at night. And they called me up and said, Sheriff, he won't talk unless he's near a window where he can see the full moon. Have you been able to pick up anything, any slips at all that uh, he might have made that might have linked him to anything that he's charged with? No, he... He, uh, he's a very careful thinker, and from what I understand from the men that have been questioning him, that he says what, uh, what he wants to, and he's very careful about how he says it. He wasn't admitting to being involved or anything. It was like a challenge. He would tell me all the time, Ken, the evidence was there. You just couldn't find it. And he didn't think we were smart enough to know anything about that. So far, several hundred pieces of evidence have been analyzed by the state's Department of Criminal Law Enforcement. And then it all fell into place. It just went boom, boom, boom. If it turns out we made a mistake, that case is over with. We're finished. Do you know something? People say, Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. There must be something in there. I showed emotion. You know what people said? See, you really can't get violent and angry. Ted Bundy was under arrest, suspected in both the brutal killings of the two sorority sisters, as well as the middle school student, Kimberly Leach. Police in both jurisdictions were very busy gathering the evidence that they needed to build these cases. There was a mountain of evidence that, that we collected. Basically, you're taking everything because you don't know what what is going to be important. Technicians there have spent over 1,600 man-hours pouring over teeth impressions, blood samples, clothing, and other articles. We were looking for fingerprints. We certainly found a lot of fingerprints, but we did not find his. Not only did we not have Mr. Bundy's fingerprints in the crime scenes, but Mr. Bundy lived at a rooming house here in Tallahassee. The room had been wiped clean. We really had no physical evidence that would have linked Bundy to these specific crimes at that time. The main evidence linking him with these crimes appears to be an eyewitness who says she thinks she can identify the killer. We had an eyewitness. One of the Calmega girls had come in late from a date and she actually saw a man uh, leaving the uh, sorority house. She was not such a strong witness because she saw this sketchy person that sort of looked like Bundy. But then along came something I'd never heard of before. For the state, perhaps the single most important piece of evidence linking Bundy to the crimes is bite marks. The bite marks found on murdered co -eds. There was injury on both of the girls from biting. One of them had injurious biting. The other had almost like a perfect signature. The prosecution claims that Bundy's teeth match those marks. To prove that, they called in Miami dental expert, Dr. Richard Suveron. Whoever left that bite had crooked teeth. In the upper jaw, there were chips in his front teeth that left scratch marks. And if you combine the number of points in the lower jaw that were consistent with the scratches in the upper, it would be pretty tough to find somebody else that had, had marks like that. There really wasn't, except for the bite marks, 
the kind of definitive physical evidence uh, that, that you, we had hoped we had had. The new field, known as forensic odontology, is only allowed as evidence in court in five states, one of them being Florida. Today, that would have been very different because those bite marks would have been swabbed for saliva, it would have gotten DNA. Uh, it's happened in 1978. DNA probably didn't start becoming a factor until around 87 or 88 in the United States. The idea of matching a bite mark in somebody's flesh with somebody else's teeth was too extraordinary for words. The bite mark evidence was certainly the most spectacular. I mean, it was eerie and, and weird because people were unfamiliar with it. Because this field was so new and so unknown, the evidence they gathered had to be rock solid and legally sound. So to get the match, they were going to need photographs and dental impressions of Ted Bundy's mouth. We wanted bite impressions because we had a photograph of the bite mark and we wanted to compare them. Normally speaking, when you want some dental press, you, you go get a, a court order. We didn't want to get a court order because then it would mean we had to confer with his lawyer. We were concerned that he might damage his teeth. He was in a very uh, secure cell that had a lot of steel, so he could have easily chipped a tooth. One anomaly, one difference, one little chip that doesn't match would throw it out. It would not be able to be used. We got a search warrant for his mouth. To our knowledge, up till then, no one had ever gotten a search warrant for somebody's mouth. Now, with a search warrant, you don't call up the person's attorney and say, we're going to be serving a search warrant. That's done by the police when the police are ready to do it. With the search warrant came an element of surprise. I don't think Bundy had any idea. One night, I went to his cell and I said, uh, Mr. Bundy, you're coming with me. I took him uh, with a series of deputy escorts to the dental office. And as we went up the back stairs after midnight, he noticed a lot of professional photographs lining the staircase. And he broke out in laughter. He thought he was going to a photo lab and uh, said, I know where I'm going, you want to take a picture of me? Well, the dentist just happened to be interested in professional photos, and that was what decorated his back staircase. Once he got upstairs into the dentist's office, I was standing there, he started screaming for his lawyer. I believe he started to put it all together. The bite mark, the evidence is there. Bundy was cuffed with his hands and his feet. So he was chained up pretty good. At that time, I read to him the complete search warrant for his mouth and the fact that the judge said we could use any and all reasonable force to retrieve those impressions. Ted Bundy looked at me and said, force? He said, Ken, come on now. You know I'm not a violent person. He sat down in the chair leaned back, opened his mouth, and it was over. I think he knew he was in trouble. He is handsome, articulate, and has a magnetic appeal to women. And the state says he's a killer. There was quite a bit of uh, turmoil and confusion. Will he be punished? He just doesn't look like the type to kill somebody. Looking him in the eyes was the first time that I felt like sick to my stomach. We think we've got a good case, but you never know, he could go free. And he was so haughty, so arrogant, and, and thumbing his nose. He told him there you were going to get me. He said he was going to get me, okay? You've got the indictment. It's all you're going to get. That was one of the first times I saw Ted Bundy really mad. The evidence against Ted Bundy was mounting. But would it be enough to finally bring the suspected serial killer to justice? And even if authorities were able to get a conviction, could they keep this master escape artist behind bars? Next time on How It Really Happened. I'm Hal Harper. Thanks for watching. When I hear Ted Bundy in so many different contexts, I stay me. Okay. I, I, I've matured in the past year. Believe me, I've grown in the past year. My only misgivings is that I might never be, might never be in a position to apply it, you know, on the streets where I'd like to apply it.
Welcome to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. Across the United States from January 1974 through February 1978, young women were disappearing and turning up dead. Their bodies found badly beaten and sexually assaulted. For years, detectives in several states searched for clues. And despite limited physical evidence, each clue led them back to one man, a law student named Ted Bundy. By the time he was captured in Florida, Bundy had been suspected in dozens of murders, including a brutal attack on a sorority house in Florida. But could investigators prove Bundy was in fact a serial killer? Here's how it really happened. From Washington State to Oregon to Utah to Colorado and now most recently to Florida, police have discovered a pattern of rape murders which coincide with Ted Bundy's movements over the past five years. Linda Ann Healy, Denise Naslin, Janice Ann Ott, George Ann Hawkins, and 18-year-old Susan Rancourt. When somebody's missing, you imagine the worst things. And it turns out what happened to her might have been worse than what we imagined. Some of them were never found. Others were found, beaten, raped, strangled, new. It seemed probable that all the crimes had been committed by the same man. He was kind of tall, very tanned, very good looking, and came up to me and asked me to help him put his sailboat onto his car. This guy identified himself as Ted, and they knew this person drove a Volkswagen. We received literally thousands of tips and interestingly Ted Bundy was among them. People teased him at the office and said say your name's Ted and you've got a Volkswagen and of course they were teasing and laughing about it because he seemed like the least likely he was the boy next door. I'm not guilty. <laughs> I'm not guilty of the charges which have been filed against me. Bundy was this crafty cunning you know attractive looking guy. I love talking to Ted because he's a great, great, talks about politics, very well read, very analytical. He had a lot of influential people that liked him and believed in him. He was making a name for himself. He has said at one point he would like to have been governor of Washington State. He had a bachelor's degree in psychology. He's in law school, university of Utah. He even joined the Mormon church. People were saying, you know, it, it couldn't be him. The Ted Bundy we knew was not a violent person. Now that was part of the, the, the enigma of Ted Bundy, that he could fool people. All throughout this, Ted was saying, I'm innocent. But we do have some things coming up that says, no, he's not. They had seized the Volkswagen and vacuumed the inside for evidence. FBI tests showed the hair found in Bundy's car matched those of the girl abducted in Murray, the nurse murdered in Colorado, and a Midvale girl who had been raped and strangled. It was the first smoking gun link to link him to these other killings. In a Salt Lake City trial, Bundy was convicted of trying to kidnap Carol Durant. Bundy was later extradited to Colorado to stand trial for murder there. He was looking for avenues of escape. The defendant was in the courtroom and uh, the guard was at the door and the last time he looked the defendant was there and the next time he looked he was gone. Where did he go? Tallahassee. He was really under the radar and nobody recognized him in Florida. During the pre-dawn hours of January 15th, the killer walked through an unlocked door at the Chi Omega sorority house and brutally beat four FSU co-eds as they slept. When he came into the sorority house, he came up the stairs. He had picked up a piece of firewood. The women who were murdered were 21-year-old Margaret Bowman and 20-year-old Lisa Levy. One was raped and bitten by the killer. The attack was to Margaret first, and then Lisa, and then he came into our room. Two girls were murdered. Two others were beaten badly. There was blood everywhere. And another woman in another location was also beaten. Bundy had pushed a chair under my front door, so they had to kick it in to be able to go in, and then that's where they found me in my bedroom. The chief suspect, Ted Bundy. He says, Al, do you think I really killed those girls that they claim I did? And 
what I said was, I don't know if you're sure, but I think if you did, you'll likely do it again. Ted Bundy was under arrest, suspected in both the brutal killings of the two sorority sisters, as well as the middle school student, Kimberly Leach. 12-year-old Kimberly Leach vanished from school in Lake City, Florida on February 9th. I've never heard the term serial killer before. She was a pretty little 12-year-old girl who had just been elected to the uh, Valentine Court at her school. Once his picture appeared in the paper, some witnesses in Lake City uh, identified him as being the, the man who had abducted Kimberly Leach. I mean, two and two uh, added up to four, and, and Ted looked like he could be our guy. But the challenge was that they didn't have all of the details of Kimberly Leach's disappearance. They didn't even know where her body was. Without those details and without her remains, it was going to be very difficult to build a case. We had search parties all out in the woods in Columbia County and Swanee County and uh, going west, Madison County, towards Tallahassee. We had to have the body. Authorities caught a break when they discovered a van near the Florida State University campus. We had a report from two children in Jacksonville that a man stopped and asked a young girl, could you help me? Her brother was not far behind. He comes running up and grabs his sister. And little did Bundy know, but their father was captain of the Duval County homicide detectives. And they had been trained well, so the young man took down the tag number, the make of the model. When we got that information, and we processed it, we find out that was a Florida State University van, and the van had been stolen. It was found abandoned in, uh, in Tallahassee. They treated it like a crime scene from the very beginning. When they vacuumed out the van, what they found was pig droppings, vegetation, and dirt. Forensic botanists analyzed the debris found in the van. They'd been searching for her body with no success, and so they came to me and said, here's some plant material we found on the undercarriage of the vehicle. Can you tell us anything about that to help us narrow the search area? The forensic botanists told them that the soil samples and the leaves and so forth come from along the banks of the Suwannee River. The pig droppings indicated there was probably some pig pens. And that narrowed their search area by over half. And then the body was found fairly soon after that. After a widespread search, Kim's body was found under a hogshed. She was beaten and sexually molested. In order to prove Ted Bundy guilty of killing Kim Leach, we had to put the two of them together. We had to put Bundy in that white van. We had to put Kim Leach in that white van. Florida Department of Criminal Law Enforcement crime lab experts are still busy sifting through and analyzing evidence. When the FSU Media Center van was recovered, in the ashtray, the, there were cigarettes that seemed to be crushed out in a kind of a unique twist. And in the field where Kim was ultimately found, somebody had dumped a, a, a vehicle ashtray. The theory was, well, maybe after the body was dumped, that he cleaned out the car and uh, emptied the ashtray and the way the cigarette butts were bitten and the particular way that they had been rushed out. The same person smoked both of those piles of cigarette butts. The crime lab made the case for us, there was no doubt about it. The van had an unusual shag carpet in the back on the floorboard of the van. There was these uh, unbelievable cross transfers from the, the carpet to her clothing recovered at the crime scene. And there was fiber from Bundy's clothing that was found at the dump site and found it on the carpet in the van. What are the odds that could happen just as a matter of coincidence if he were not, in fact, the perpetrator? Kimberly Leach vanished February 9th. Her body was found on April 7th. There seemed to be a pretty massive trauma to her throat area and, and bleeding. Eyewitness News has learned the prosecution has evidence linking Bundy with a knife that could have killed Kimberly Leach. Two price stickers, one on top of the other, were found inside the white van. They were traced to this hunting supply store on Jacksonville's west side. The proprietor picked Bundy out as having purchased uh, that knife the day before that he kidnapped Kim. There was just one inescapable conclusion, and that was that Bundy was responsible for Kim's death and abduction. You're standing.
standard medium security life in a prison is, is a fairly decent existence, relatively speaking. It's just creating your own environment in here and not looking at the ceiling, not looking at the wall, and not thinking about the outside, and not anguishing over the fact that you've lost your freedom. We didn't get the murder indictment un until we knew we had good evidence. The local newspaper sent their attorney to my office and said they wanted to be present when he was informed of the charges. They wanted to see the expression on his face. Step out, Mr. Bunch. When he was taken out of his cell, he had no idea why. He came down, the elevator door opened, and he saw a camera there, but he had no idea. Step out, Mr. Bunch. What do we have here, Ken? Let's see. Oh, it's an indictment, all right. Why don't you read it to me? Oh, what have you got here, Ken? Oh, what have you got? Let's read it. Let's go. I wish this, this, this arrogant loudmouth would have kept his mouth shut so Ken could have done his job. Theodore Robert Bundy, you are charged. Indictment, two counts, burglary, and uh, two counts, murder in the first degree. He walked in like a, a banty rooster in his blue jail suit and he strutted around the room while the sheriff is reading this and he's kind of walking you know a semi-circle around the sheriff i'll plead not guilty right now you're on bond for election aren't you mr bonnie got it didn't you mr bonnie told me that you told him that you're going to get me he said he was going to get me okay you got the indictment it's all you're going to get that was one of the first times I saw Ted Bundy really mad. Police charged Bundy not only with the murder of the two co-eds, but with the killing of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. Both cases were capital cases, and a conviction could mean the death penalty. So before the trials began, the prosecutors came to Ted Bundy and made him an offer. If you plead guilty to all the charges, we will take the death penalty off the table. Well, the plea bargain came about from a feeling that, you know, you, you're probably not going to win both trials. They understood that their cases were not all that strong. This is probably a better decision than risking a trial. He would be sentenced to life in prison with a minimum mandatory service of 75 years without parole. Realize that this was a circumstantial evidence case. We could lose this case. What I was mainly concerned about here was getting Mr. Bundy off the streets forever. Larry called me and he asked me what I thought. At that point, I think more than anything, you just want them never to be able to hurt anyone ever again. The long plea form was developed with eight or 10 signature lines on it, including Mr. Bundy's. And uh, after it was signed, it was left with him at the jail. Prosecution has said, now listen, we want Mr. Bundy to simply confess to the murders. If he does anything other than that, the deal's off. When he came to court the next morning, he had torn the section of the plea form with his name on it off. Mr. Bundy stood up and started criticizing everybody he could think of. He attacked his lawyers and said, well, Your Honor, before I enter this plea, I want to dismiss my lawyers because they don't believe in my innocence. I looked at the prosecutor from Not Lake City and he looked at me and we stood up and said, that's it, it's over. And we're wasting our time to go through the charade of a plea now. With the plea bargain now dead, both cases would go to trial. You're going to represent yourself or you're going to get another attorney? I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. I just remember fixating on Bundy and looking him in the eyes. I felt like sick to my stomach. I know that, that there's a lot of uh, police ego on the line. I think it's a terribly dangerous mentality to try to pin something on somebody who they might, who they believe there's a possibility it couldn't have done it and as long as they believe that they're not going to find the right man ted he sent a couple letters to me from prison why aren't the police looking in this direction for that crime because anybody can see that that's how it happened i think there was a still this apprehension of is he the right person or could there be more people i still wasn't sure it was him let's get all the facts because I don't want to go do, through this again if it's the wrong person. Police charge Bundy not only with the murder of the two co-eds, but with the killing of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, who vanished from school in Lake City, Florida on February 9th. 
the Tallahassee case was deemed to be weaker from a prosecution standpoint than the Lake City case. Well, there was always a measure of doubt because the evidence was questionable. And not only did we not have Mr. Bundy's fingerprints in the crime scenes, but we had unidentified fingerprints even to this day uh, in those crime scenes. There were two bite marks, which of course was the principal evidence in this in this case. But there really wasn't, except for the bite marks, the kind of definitive physical evidence uh, that, that you, we had hoped we had had. I always felt confident that we had the right person charged. What I wasn't confident of is what the jury's reaction to a circumstantial evidence case like this would be. Police in both jurisdictions were very busy gathering the evidence that they needed to build these cases and also making sure that Ted Bundy, a two-time prison escapee, remained behind bars. Once he jumped out of a courthouse window, the other time he crawled through a foot-wide light fixture. The real measure of a man in prison, as far as escape goes, is the difference between hitting that fence and not hitting that fence, between getting shot at and not getting shot at, and having the guts to do it and not having the guts to do it. Bundy told prison officials here, don't take it personally, but if I can escape from this prison, I will. He takes opportunities wherever they exist to escape, so you have to eliminate the opportunities. Will he be in a cell with anyone else here? He'll be by himself in a self-contained cell, uh, completely surrounded with armor plate. He wanted me to take him to the Florida State University Law Library so that he could work in the law library. My answer to that was, yeah, right. But Bundy was not going down without a fight. He took the sheriff to court, claiming that his civil rights were being violated. He sued me. There's a lawsuit, Ted Bundy versus Sheriff Ken Casares. The improvement line exercise and a number of other things I'd like the court to consider. I had to offer better lighting. Interestingly enough, I gave him better lighting and he took me back to the court and said the light was too bright. He wanted access to outdoor activity. I was ordered to give him one hour three times a week outside. I had my tactical unit officer stationed at the corners of the building. They had a scoped, high-powered rifle and a canine. We are not going to lose Theodore Robert Bundy, I can assure you. It has been nearly a year since law student and former political campaign worker Ted Bundy was accused of the brutal slayings of two Florida state co-eds. Ted Bundy once again decided to act in his own defense. You're going to represent yourself or you're going to get another attorney? I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. Florida is one of seven states in the United States that allows pre-trial depositions, sworn testimony before the trial starts. While Mr. Bundy was representing himself, he wanted to take depositions from the witnesses. And I had the witnesses uh, come to the jail and uh, let Mr. Bundy uh, take their depositions. It was bizarre. We went into this classroom and I had lawyers on both sides of me. And there's guards and he comes in and sits down and he starts asking me questions. Bundy sat on one end and I sat at the other end. I just remember fixating on Bundy and looking him in the eyes. I felt like sick to my stomach. I'm sure if he had made moved a muscle, they would have been on him like syrup on French toast. Some of the questions that he was asking, he, he did have a familiarity with the house that someone else would not have had. I was convinced he had been in the house. I was totally convinced. I know what's there and I know what isn't there. I've seen the files and I've heard the reports. Uh, and Lord knows I'm the first and foremost person who has the personal and intimate knowledge that it couldn't be me, that it's not me, that I'm innocent. And let's just wait and let's just let it come out in court and I'll lay my money on me. That how it really happened. I'm Hill Harper. In the summer of 1979, after being suspected in multiple murders across the United States, Ted Bundy stands trial for the brutal attacks at Florida State University. The trial was televised and the country was riveted. Ted Bundy acted as his own attorney and no one was prepared for the circus that followed. 
Security guards checking for concealed weapons outside the courtroom tell the story that this is no ordinary murder trial. The case of Ted Bundy, a man suspected of murdering two Florida State co-eds and beating three others. Complete and utter shock. We, we still don't believe it. It just, just can't be. Our son is the best son in the world. The women who were murdered were 21-year-old Margaret Bowman and 20-year-old Lisa Levy. My family has lived with horror, sorrow, and pain. It's an emotional pain so deep it becomes physical. Uh, that's Margaret. That's a good Yeah, she was a pretty girl. I think of Lisa and Margaret a lot. Margaret was, I believe, an art history major, and she wanted to be a curator at a museum. Lisa was that girl next door, fun, always had a smile on her face. It upset me that he took that away. Hello and welcome to the State of Florida versus Theodore Robert Bundy. Please be seated. Court will come to order. The 500-mile change of venue from Tallahassee to Miami did nothing to lessen all of the hoopla surrounding the trial. It was going to be televised live, gavel to gavel, one of the first of its kind. It was crazy. The TV trucks were all over. I'd never been in a circus like that in my life. The Bundy trial has drawn a lot of attention, partly because of who he is, a mysterious former law student with a charming air in court. It was this weird celebrity that he fostered in a way. He loved it. He was basking in the attention. I screened the mail at the jail. There were a lot of love letters and proposals of marriage to Ted Bundy, which was bizarre. As strange as it may sound, there were groupies that followed him from courthouse to courthouse, his adoring fans. He just doesn't look like the type to kill somebody. And I noticed that most of the people that were in there were women. What is unusual to see is that many of the onlookers are women, young women, contemporaries of the Florida State sorority sisters who were assaulted in their beds a year and a half ago. So we started interviewing these young women and, um, you know, you could see by their eyes they were just fascinated by the, the, the lurid details, the, the, the savagery of the, of the crimes. Every time he turns around I kind of get that feeling, no, no, you know, going to get me next. But yet you're, you're fascinated by it. Very, very. <laughs> this one woman, and I don't think she missed today, she sat right there on the front row and and she would alternately make moon eyes at Bundy and stare daggers at Carol Boone. Carol Boone believes Bundy is completely innocent. Some have called her his girlfriend. She prefers to be known as just a close personal friend. Let me put it this way. I, I, I don't think that, that Ted belongs in jail. Carol Boone says she first met Ted Bundy five years ago when they worked in the same office in Seattle, Washington. Since that time, she has followed him, helping him prepare his legal cases. From Utah, where he was convicted of kidnapping a young woman, to Colorado, where he is suspected of murdering another, and finally now to Florida. She had an explanation or an answer for every circumstance in every case, what was wrong about it, identifications had been coerced or were inaccurate, the physical evidence didn't hold up. I don't think they had reason to charge Ted Bundy with, with murder. For the first time, jurors in the Theodore Bundy murder trial were brought in to hear one of the two crime scenes where two Florida State sorority sisters were strangled to death and three others brutally beaten with a club the morning of January 15, 1978. He had picked up a piece of firewood and he attacked Margaret. He attacked Lisa Levy. He used pantyhose, strangled her, bit her, did other things, and then came into our room. When police officer Oscar Brannon took the stand, he described the first victim who was discovered, Karen Chandler. Uh, the side of her face looked like it had been uh, literally with a crush. I shot blows, where it's going to stick, because it was bark, tangled in her hair, and blood on the side of her face. Officer Brennan said it was shortly afterwards that the bodies of the two murdered co-eds were found. One of the young women had a stocking wrapped tightly around her throat. He uh, strangled her with a, a pair of pantyhose that he had brought with him. Now we know that because the brand of pantyhose was not one either used by Margaret or any of the young women in the Carmega sorority house. Some of the first witnesses who are expected to testify this week are Kyle Mega co-eds who were there when the killings occurred. You know, I just prayed mightily ahead of time that I would be calm and that I'd be uh, not react, um, knowing, of course, that he would probably take some kind of pleasure in scaring people or scaring us. The only time I was really 
nervous walking in. When the two who survived were brought in to testify, first Karen Chandler and then Kathy Kleiner, both said they had no recollection of what had happened to them. At that point, Bundy was his serving as his own lawyer. And then he got up and asked me questions. Did you see my face? You know, how do you know it was me? Cheryl Ann Thomas told the court she only remembers coming home after a night of disco dancing, going to bed, and then waking up in the hospital. I had um, five skull fractures and multiple contusions in my head, and um, I had a broken jaw, and my left shoulder was pulled out of joint. It was odd because he was right across from me, and um, he looked at me as if he didn't know me at all. It's unbelievable. Judge Coward has said he expects the trial to last from 30 to 45 days. I don't think I really had made up my mind until about halfway through the trial when uh, during the courtroom recess I came face to face with Bundy himself and that encounter was unbelievable. His eyes turned like laser beams. It was sheer hostility. Anger, hostility, viciousness that I saw in that face. He took his mask off at that moment and I saw something that you never saw in the courtroom. That told me he was a killer. You can't help but become an advocate for yourself when you're so involved in the case. I'm being a good defense attorney and I'm not, again, I'm not pretending I'm an attorney, but I felt it was right. I wanted to get involved. The prosecuting attorneys have told the jurors that they believe one man on the morning of January 15, 1978, walked into the Florida State Chi Omega house, strangled two young co-eds, brutally beat two others, and then struck again four blocks away, nearly killing a fifth young woman. That man, the prosecutors say, is the defendant, Theodore Bundy. Due to the television coverage, key players in this case were becoming household names. One of them was Nita Neary, a prosecution witness who said that she saw Ted Bundy leaving that sorority house just minutes after the attacks. Could you describe the man that you saw at the door? Had a very prominent nose, uh, a straight bridge that almost came to a point. It was slightly uh, dark complected. And is that man in the courtroom today? Yes, he is. Would you point him out for us, please? That morning uh, that the murders occurred, she sat down with an artist and described the person that she saw. And this was at a time before anybody in Tallahassee had ever heard of Mr. Bundy. So it, it was not a sketch that had been influenced in any way by pretrial publicity or media coverage or anything else like that. The defense, however, says the eyewitness, Nita Neary, caught only a fleeting glimpse of the man, and they argue that her story is unreliable. She had very little time to see the person different than what she described. Because after his arrest, he was, he was on video, he was on TV, he was in the newspapers all the time. He became a, a very well-known face. So for her to sit in a trial and say, yeah, that's the guy, it's not surprising. The defense would also attack the testimony of Dr. Richard Suveron, the forensic dentist who says that the bite marks left on victim Lisa Levy were definitely matched by Ted Bundy. I had a board and I pointed out all the areas of comparison, his teeth and this and this and this. And then the jury took the one-to-one -one photographs and the models. We as reporters, you know, were spellbound just sitting there watching these graphics of uh, flesh that had been macerated and Bundy's teeth. The prosecution asked Suveron if he could scientifically match up the teeth marks with Bundy's teeth. There's no question that the teeth fit the bite mark. They made the mark. And there's obviously something wrong with the observations made by the state's odontologists. Our contention all along, Your Honor, has been that they have taken my teeth and twisted them every which way but loose to fit. Ted Bundy was not shy about sharing his opinions in court, especially when he got to play the role of his own defense attorney. The defendant, Theodore Bundy, dressed in a tweed coat and a Seattle Mariners t-shirt, became the attorney today, acting directly in his own defense. Since he was co-counsel, he could decide what direction the defense would go. We were unable to make decisions independent of him. He, through the force of his personality, kind of controlled how things went. 
Bundy has said he feels impelled to take a leading role in his own defense. It is not known what his own attorneys think of this, but there is no evidence as yet that they are trying to dissuade him from taking the floor. Most of Ted Bundy's time in the courtroom was spent conferring with his co-counsel, but he decided to take the lead when the time came to cross-examine the police officer about what exactly he saw when he responded to the Chi Omega murder scene. And that move may have cost the defense this case. I called uh, to the stand one of the first officers on the scene at the Chi Omega house that morning. You know, just kind of a basic overview of what he found whenever he first got there. And I was to question that officer. As I stand up, Ted stands up beside me and reaches for the file. But now I'm acting like this is what was planned. At one point, when a university police officer was on the stand, Bundy himself, not his attorneys, did the cross-examining. The first victim you saw... And he asked a few peremptory questions, and then he says, uh, describe in great detail what you saw when you pulled back the covers. And I, I felt like that was just about the worst thing that anybody could have ever done. I remember that cross-examination, and it seemed sort of weirdly like time almost stopped, and he was, it was a way for him to get to relive those crimes. It was offensive. You have to understand, at that point, Mr. Bundy had vehemently denied any involvement in any of this stuff. It was uh, very disheartening, uh, incredibly disheartening. It was exactly three hours ago that Judge Edward Coward gave the case to the jury. They are now deliberating behind closed doors. Bundy has said in court that he expects to win this case. Last night, he told two reporters... I've never been convicted of murder before, and I, 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 I hope and pray I won't be. But if it happens, then I have an excellent uh, case for appeal. Lynn. What we see going on here today is something that I have no responsibility for. Just six and a half hours after Judge Edward Coward handed the case to the jury, the 12-member panel returned with a verdict. Are you confident that he will be acquitted here? I hope he will be acquitted. I can't say I'm confident, but uh, I believe he should be on the basis of the non-evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, have you reached a verdict? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The jury was out, I want to say, a little over six hours before they returned a the verdict. And nobody knew what the answer was going to be. Either you get a not guilty or you get a guilty. There's really nothing in between. Phil, you're going to win this case? I believe we will, yes. We were thinking that the appropriate verdict was not guilty. We the jury, find the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy, guilty as charged. So say we all. Bundy said he was hopeful and optimistic jurors would see things his way. They did not. After years of being suspected and more than a dozen deaths, Ted Bundy was now a convicted murderer. And there was a kind of a collective gasp in the courtroom, but I think it was one of, largely of, of, of resolution. All guilty verdicts on all of uh, the counts. It was just a huge sigh of relief. We're very satisfied with what uh, verdict we did get in this case. Uh, we couldn't have expected it to be any better than it was. The verdict came through, and it was like a relief. What was your first reaction when you heard that verdict? Thank God, it's over. It was kind of a, a deep sigh and a terrible feeling for Margaret and Lisa. It was like they can't see this, and they can't go on. I never had any doubt, almost from the beginning, that was gut. And of course, you don't go to court with gut. That's why we work so hard on the case. He was so arrogant. Uh, he, he thought he was smarter than everybody else and probably figured that, you know, we would never be able to convict him. It just was a relief to me. He was off the streets. He would be, still be killing people. Throughout the clerk's reading of the verdict, Bundy showed little reaction. I didn't show any emotion because you know, what am I supposed to do? Am I going to jump up on the table? Am I going to scream? That's what I felt like doing. I heard my mother crying. Needless to say, I, I think the jury is totally wrong. It's, it's just impossible. It's wrong. We'll appeal it. it. It's just... What else can I say? She was so sincere and so strong in, in her defense of her son. You know, she said he couldn't have done it. He couldn't have done it. I'm innocent of the charges of which I've been convicted. 
The defendant's mother sat quietly, later remarking that she would have liked to, quote, wring the prosecutor's neck. One week later, court reconvened for sentencing. The overwhelming public sentiment is that everyone wanted Ted Bundy to die. Give him the same amount of mercy that he gave Lisa Levy and Margaret Fulton, which was absolutely nothing. It required a majority of the jurors to recommend the death penalty in order for it to be a death penalty verdict. This court is hereby imposed death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. Today at age 32, Theodore Robert Bundy stood in a Florida courtroom and listened to a judge describe his pending death in the Florida electric chair. Justice is a funny thing. What kind of justice do you pay for killing all those women? I don't think that there's any such thing as justice. I would say that when he was sentenced to death, my, my gut feeling was he'll never hurt anyone ever again. Ted Bundy was already looking at the death penalty when he faced another possible death penalty for the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. She was the middle school student who was abducted right outside of her school just three weeks after the Chi Omega murders. Ted was completely disinterested in the Lake City case. The pressure that he put us on us in defense in the Tallahassee case was gone. He was there. He didn't want to do anything. He just, whatever happens, happens. Sure, I've been through this before, and it doesn't matter. From a trial standpoint, that case was much stronger. When he kidnapped Kim Leach, there was these uh, unbelievable cross transfers from the, the carpet from the FSU Media Center van to her clothing were covered at the crime scene. We had fibers from the blue blazer that he wore on Kim's clothing, fibers from Kim's clothing on the blue blazer. It was just such a, a strong, conclusive chain of circumstances. After three weeks of testimony from both eyewitnesses and experts, the jury came back with a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy, guilty of murder in the first degree. He's a guilty on all counts, and the uh, sentence was death. This is the sentence of this court that you, Theodore Robert Bundy, be sentenced to death for the murder of Kimberly Diane Leach. When they recommended death, and that uh, decision was announced, Bundy screamed at them in the courtroom. Tell the jury that they were wrong. <laughs> Ted Bundy sits on Florida's death row. I think I stand about as much chance of dying in front of a firing squad or in a gas chamber as you do being killed on a plane flight home. Because it's not going to happen. His lawyers claim Bundy is mentally incompetent and therefore cannot be executed under Florida law. It's time to, to end it now. He took their life. Shouldn't he give his? I kept thinking of Margaret and Lisa, how their lives would have been, could have been wonderful. And it upset me that he took that away. And he kept getting stays. Different judges gave him stays for a number of years. The U.S. Appellate Court ruling marks the second time Lord has tried to execute Ted Bundy, and the second time it's been blocked. I was just feeling, well, the judges that give him stays should have their daughter date him. Ted realized that he had information that law enforcement wanted. That's when we received a call that he wanted to talk to us. Bundy has spent the past few days confessing to up to 20 murders in several states. We have enough information to know that it was pure evil. Now he was bargaining for his life. But he also threatened to withhold information. Time and patience, I really, I think that those are two good words. You can't hope to drag it out of a guy overnight. Ted Bundy was now a resident of Florida's death row. Despite being convicted of three murders and suspected in dozens more, he continued to proclaim his innocence. Then, after nearly 10 years of appeals, Ted Bundy began to talk. His death row confessions next time on how it really happened. I'm Hill Harper. Thanks for watching. I'm satisfied with, with my blanket statement that I'm innocent. Uh, no man is truly innocent. Uh, I mean, we all have transgressed in some way in our lives. And as I say, I, I've been uh, impolite and I, there are things I regret having done in my life. Uh, but 
than nothing like the, the things I think that you're referring to. Welcome to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. In 1980, the name Ted Bundy was one of the most recognized in America, but for all the wrong reasons. The charismatic former law student was facing the electric chair for the brutal murders of two sorority sisters and a 12-year-old girl in Florida. Bundy was also suspected in dozens of additional murders across the country, but always maintained his innocence. Now, in a fight to save his own life, Bundy launched a series of appeals from death row. Would it work? Here's how it really happened. A wave of fear swept all across the state of Washington from January to July of 1974 when someone was abducting young women. Witnesses told of a smooth-talking, good-looking young man named Ted who'd been seen talking with them. Police released a composite drawing and description of Ted. The newspaper put the composite out and my friend threw the picture on the table the composite and she said to me who is who do you think that is I said well it's Ted why and then she burst into tears because that looked a lot like her boyfriend Ted Bundy a lot like him there was nothing that would lead me to think that he was a violent man Ted was born in a home for unwed mothers in Vermont in 1946 Bundy's mother she was a single mother Ted being the oldest and uh, you might say my pride and joy our relationship was always very special. A very normal, active boy. He uh, was, did all the things that most boys like to do. Theodore Robert Bundy, at age 25, a Republican campaign worker in Seattle. At 28, a University of Utah law student. Bundy was someone who was surging ahead in life. Seemed to have a lot going for him. His friends would even say, now there's somebody that's going to make a mark in life. They were right about that, but not in the way that they thought. Theodore Bundy was convicted of murder in the 1978 killings of two sorority sisters and a 12-year-old girl. The FBI says he is a suspect in the sex-related murders or disappearance of more than 30 other women in four states between 1974 and 1978. People have said he was evil. I, I think he was just a savage, feral, wild monster that was loose on humankind. Linda Ann Healy, 19-year-old Donna Manson, Kathy Parks, 22-year-old Brenda Ball, 18-year-old George Ann Hawkins, Janice Ott, 18-year-old Denise Naslam, Susan Rancourt. She had gone across campus to a meeting and she never came back. He was very big on using the ruse of a helpless person and Bundy depended on good, kind women with good hearts helping him. This guy came up and asked me to help him put his sailboat onto his car. He looks clean cut. You're only gonna help for two or three minutes and then bam, you're in the car. And a couple hours later, you're dead. It really hit me like a ton of bricks because I knew if I had made that wrong decision, it could have been me. Young ladies began to disappear in Utah more disappearances this time in Colorado he was smart he really was and he did everything he could to gain advantage over people and situations prosecutors convicted Bundy not of murder but of attempted kidnapping and sent him to prison he managed to escape from jail twice Bundy who had been awaiting trial for the January 12 1975 murder of a Michigan nurse near Aspen, Colorado, escaped from a Colorado jail on December 31, 1977. He's got $700 with him. It's a lot of money back then. Called a flight to Chicago. From Chicago, he took a train to Ann Arbor, went to, through Nashville, went down to Atlanta, took a trailways bus to Tallahassee, and the circus began in Florida. Two Florida State sorority sisters were strangled to death and three others brutally beaten with a club the morning of January 15, 1978. Bundy had entered through an unlocked door on the first floor of the Caromega sorority house. Had gone up the back stairs. I woke up to being attacked. There was blood everywhere. 
The next thing I remember, I was in the hospital. We were just so overwhelmed with grief. Complete and utter shock. We we still don't believe it. It just, just can't be. This is no ordinary murder trial. The case of Ted Bundy, a man suspected of murdering two Florida State co-eds and beating three others a year and a half ago, has caught the attention of the national press. During a court recess, the defendant, Theodore Bundy, who was partially acting as his own attorney, examined some of the evidence. Now he got to be his own lawyer in the most celebrated and widely watched trial in Florida history. He strutted and preened and he loved to cross-examine witnesses. And before I forget to ask a $64,000 question, did you have a search warrant to search my car? No, sir. Putting yourself in a position of being your own counsel, you're going to do it because the person you're representing is innocent. Bundy said he was hopeful and optimistic jurors would see things his way. They did not. This court has hereby imposed the death penalty upon the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy. I don't even like to think of that day. I heard my mother crying. It's just, it's just impossible. It's wrong. When he was sentenced to death, my, my gut feeling was he'll never hurt anyone ever again. I don't think it'll be over really for any of us until they finally execute him. I think I stand about as much chance of dying in front of a firing squad or in a gas chamber as you do being killed on a plane flight home. Because it's not going to happen. Ted Bundy sits on Florida's death row, convicted of the brutal murders of two Florida State University sorority sisters and a 12-year-old Lake City girl. After being given the death penalty twice, Ted Bundy became a resident of death row. And then, of course, he started his appeals process. When the uh, death warrant, the first one, was signed for Ted Bundy, he had a petition pending in the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court doesn't like to deal with clients who represent themselves, so I agreed to do it. Mr. Bundy was denied a fair trial. He argued that he had been denied his right to a fair trial because of, all things, ineffective counsel. The irony of that, of course, is that Ted Bundy acted as his own counsel. I mean, th there must have been a kind of theatrical thrill for him getting to play lawyer after washing out as a law student. I come here this morning and I'm you know, ambushed. People are making a look. You haven't lost yet. Haven't lost yet. I don't tend to. He was playing lawyer and he wasn't aware of what the consequences were going to be. Let's let it go. Mr. Bundy spent a good deal of his time uh, essentially intoxicated. The alcohol was found in the cans of VHs. But what? Was, he was a handsome guy. I kind of found it interesting to watch him litigate. It was Ted, typical Ted. The, his movements, the way he looked, he always would look sort of like this when he was in the thing. It was Ted, you know, the Ted I knew anyway. I, I just think that he was egotistical and didn't want to be wrong about anything. Please be seated. Court will come to order. He just felt like no attorney was as good as he was. Bundy employed as many as 14 defense attorneys and even represented himself at times. His attorneys now say that representation was ineffective and are asking for a new trial. The ineffective counsel claim was rejected by the higher courts. So Ted's lawyers brought a claim of mental incompetence. I'm not going through this. You knew that, Your Honor. Sit down. You know how far you can push me. His lawyers claim Bundy is mentally incompetent and therefore cannot be executed under Florida law. And this was something that Ted Bundy had absolutely fought against and rejected in his first two trials. Because Bundy had an ego and it had some legal training, he, wouldn't, he would not allow his defense attorneys to do that. But now that his life was on the line, he was willing to offer it. Mr. Bundy, do you believe you are competent during your trial? Ted Bundy's behavior had become increasingly bizarre in the Kimberly Leach trial. Mr. Bundy spent a good deal of his time uh, essentially intoxicated. The alcohol was found in the cans of V8 juice, resealable 16 ounce cans of V8 juice. There were several small containers we found out later were mixed with vodka. I'll be darned. I didn't know that. During the death penalty phase of our trial, Bundy actually did closing argument with a jury. The most baffling moment was when Ted questioned Carol Boone, and he called her as a character witness. Carol Boone says she first met Ted Bundy five years ago when they worked in the same office in Seattle, Washington. 
Some have called her his girlfriend. Let me put it this way. I, I, I don't think that, that Ted belongs in jail. She was in contact with Ted daily. He would give her instructions for the defense team, and we were to carry out his instructions. She was quite forceful in making us do these things that Ted wanted done. She cooked up an idea that he would call her as a witness in the penalty phase of the trial. He used the penalty phase of the trial when the jury is considering whether he should be sentenced to death to get married. Very well thought out and planned. They had the blood test, they had the marriage license. Somewhere they were, they recruited a notary public to come sit in the audience and wait for Bundy to pronounce him and Carol Boone man and wife. I think it was pragmatic. They needed to have a court proceeding and so this was going to be a legally binding marriage and the only way they could do it was in the courtrooms. And uh, he asked her, you know, do you love me? And she said, oh yes I do. And he said, I love you. And we just, you know, were hanging on each question. Carol. He said, will you marry me? And she said, yes, I will. Hereby marry you. And we go, what? And he said, I now pronounce this man and wife and the New Republic signed a marriage license. And by God, they were married right there in the middle of the penalty phase. Bundy's attorneys claim that in itself should have raised a red flag about his mental condition. They agreed with us that uh, there was sufficient evidence of Bundy's incompetence that we were entitled to a hearing. The three-judge panel issued the stay of execution without comment. For three years, Ted Bundy's attorney, James Coleman, argued his case all the way from the state appellate court to the Supreme Court. And he succeeded in winning three stays of execution. But in January of 1989, the clock ran down on the fourth death warrant. He wanted to live. I'm at the Florida State Prison. I'm going to interview Ted Bundy. Ted realized that he had information that law enforcement wanted. That's when we received a call that he wanted to talk to us. Uh, I don't think anybody doubts that, uh, that I've done some bad things. Uh, the question is what, of course, and, and how, and, and maybe even most importantly, why. Ted Bundy, a one-time law student who became one of the FBI's ten most wanted, stands convicted of three murders and is still suspected in more than 30 others. Nearly nine years ago, Bundy made tape recordings in his Florida jail cell for two authors who chronicled his criminal career. Bundy was emotional about hearing reports of his case. I do take it rather personally when at least here in broadcast that uh, people want to kill, even though I know that uh, there are a great number of people with that opinion. I just said that I hear it. Thank you. Bundy has been in Florida's state prison on death row for nearly 10 years. He has been sentenced to death four times in old Sparky, the state's electric chair. It was very disappointing to me that this guy had, you know, not received a fair trial. What's ahead for convicted murderer Theodore Bundy now is a long appeals process. What we have to do is to prepare to litigate in three or four courts at the same time. We would file in the circuit court. He's entitled to a new sentence. In the Florida Supreme Court. Although Bundy managed to avoid one of Governor Graham's death warrants, another is imminent. He kept getting stays. Different judges gave him stays for a number of years. The U.S. Appellate Court ruling marks the second time Lord has tried to execute Ted Bundy, and the second time it's been blocked. I kept thinking of Margaret and Lisa, how their lives would have been, could have been wonderful. And it upset me that he took that away. It's time to, to end it now. He took their life, shouldn't he give his? I was just feeling, well, the judges, they give them stays, should have their daughter date him. The life or death of convicted murderer Ted Bundy is now in the hands of the Florida Supreme Court. From the start of 1989, Ted Bundy and his lawyers had been successful in three stays of execution, but the fourth death warrant, scheduled for Tuesday, January 24th, 1989, was looming. When we got the last warrant, I think that there was an enormous pressure on the judges, especially, 
to not allow this person to get out of a conviction. Are you tired this is going on for so long? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think the public being fed up has anything to do with whether we ought to pursue constitutional claims. Uh, that's the way the system works. I think the end is drawing very near and, and the final chapter on Ted Bundy is about to be written. I went up and talked to his mother uh, a couple of times. I felt very sorry for her. We gave him a good upbringing and something has happened to him sometime since he left this house that has triggered some terrible madness inside of him. She just simply could not even comprehend it. It was, for better words, she was a basket case. I guess it's been going on for so long that we have little by little been realizing that this was going to happen eventually and um, I, I won't say I really accept it but I know it's going to happen and we've just have learned to live with it every mom wants their child to be a success every mom and to see this happen uh, was I'm sure it's what killed her as time went by it was very sad for me to know that he had a mother that loved him so much and he seemed like such a handsome man and with such a future and it's it's shocking it's a shocking story Wendy was described by prison officials as becoming increasingly nervous as his execution approached he was quiet most of the time he seemed a little depressed at times. It appeared to me that he realizes that uh, uh, there's only a few hours left. With the clock ticking, James Coleman continued pleading the case in court. But what he didn't know was at the exact same time, Ted Bundy was pleading his case from death row. We were still trying to get the execution stopped. I went to Tallahassee uh, to argue in the Supreme Court. When I got up, they claimed then the headlines were that Ted Bundy had confessed to 12 murders. And I, I knew at that point that, you know, we don't have a chance. Bundy has confessed to murders in western states in the past few days in interviews with law enforcement officials. I'm sure his whole strategy was just to give us a little to nibble on, and then in hopes we try and get a stay for him. We'll start. Obviously, we got to start somewhere. It was Washington, basically Washington State where those first murders took place. I've been told that, uh, you know, the parents of these, of these girls are, are fairly decent people. I don't know. And I really feel for them because apparently they've suffered some uh, an incredible tragedy in their lives. The loss of a loved one is, is probably, probably the most extreme kind of loss you can suffer in, in this life. And I say I, I feel as much for them as anybody can. Welcome back to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. By 1989, Ted Bundy had been on Florida death row for 10 years, proclaiming his innocence while his attorneys fought to overturn his murder convictions. His legal team had won three stays of execution, but now Bundy's luck was running out. As his date with the electric chair approached, Bundy called investigators from across the country, offering to confess to some unsolved cases and finally tell them how he really did it. He started to meet with the police and he was doing it in secret. My view was if he wanted to disclose where bodies were buried, then he should do that and not place any conditions on it. I think that he saw a way to possibly try to save his life. Bob Keppel worked at getting a confession from Ted Bundy for years. I went down to Florida to interview him on three separate occasions and we used the interviews in 1984 as a way for him to talk about what he would do if he were the killer. My feeling about the guy is he's very low-key and inoffensive. And uh, he's, he has a method of approach. He has a lure or a ruse. Obviously, he's very, very wary how he picks up the victim. He's waiting for the right time to approach. He doesn't want anybody around. He doesn't want anybody to overhear what he says to the girl. He doesn't want anybody to see him get it at all possible. And he certainly doesn't want anybody to see him getting in the car. And then in 88, it was more like 
getting him ready to talk to us again. When Keppel went to Florida nearly one year ago, he was still playing Bundy's game, trying to get any information on the Washington murders. We'd already come to the conclusion a long time ago that he, he was the one that did him. You're leaving the area pretty well bare, and he's not leaving you clothing on the victims. I mean, yes, sir, in any number of ways to dispose of the clothing, he could be burying it, he could be burning it at home if he has a fireplace. He might be simply throwing the shit out the window of the car he's driving the wall. The last interview with him was the most telling. He was supposed to have had some spiritual change. I'm very skeptical of that, I don't buy that at all. But to all the investigators, he did give it up. That was the first time that I know of that he's admitted any murders to anyone. And after hearing some of the details of what he's done, I can understand why it's difficult. Because uh, they're not particularly pleasant. Bundy, delivering details about the murder of George Ann Hawkins. The night of June 10th, 18-year-old George Ann Hawkins left a fraternity to make this walk just 90 feet down a well-lit alley back to her sorority at the University of Washington. Bundy told Keppel he found Hawkins walking in a U-District alley about midnight. Using a, uh, a briefcase and some crutches, and the young woman walked down. I saw, saw her round the, the north end of the block into the alley and asked her to help me carry the briefcase. We reached the car, I knocked her unconscious with the crowbar and I handcuffed her and drove away. Is she alive or dead? Oh, no, no, she, she was unconscious, but she it was very much alive. Then I again knocked her unconscious and strangled her. I asked him if he killed the two girls at Lake Sammamish State Park and he said yes. Asked him if he killed Brenda Ball, he said yes. And he said with Sue that he rendered her unconscious and took her to an orchard. We know that much, but that's we don't need to know what he did. We have enough information to know that it was pure evil. Ted Bundy was infamous as an intelligent and handsome charmer, a highly likable boy next door. When I would think about our day-to-day -day relationship, there was nothing there that would lead me to think that he was capable of doing something like that. Um, and that's the split that I think had everybody baffled. He confessed to my friend and told her all the stuff outright. Then he mentioned the day July 14th when two women were abducted from Lake Sammamish and, and we went out to eat that night about five and he was saying that he remembered that he ate two hamburgers and that he enjoyed every bite of it. He said that it wasn't that he'd forgotten what he'd done that day or that he didn't remember but just that it was over and then he said it's pretty scary isn't it. And then a day later he calls her back and said what you think you heard you didn't hear right. This man felt nothing. And with all the people he'd done in, with all the harm he'd done, he still felt nothing. So there's nothing to say sorry for because he didn't feel sorry. Bundy lived in Washington until late 1974, building a promising career in politics. At the same time he came to law school in Salt Lake City, young ladies began to disappear in Utah. Bundy admitted to the homicide and kidnapping of uh, the Kent girl from up in Bountiful. Debbie was attending a play with her family at Viewmont High School on the night of November 8, 1974. She left the play early to pick up her brother at an ice rink. Well, there was Debbie Kent up in, in uh, Bountiful at the high school. Was she killed right there at the school? No. But you are responsible for, for her death, though? Yes. He said he d dumped um, Debbie Kent's body off at, uh, I think it's Fairview, Utah. And he did find a patella portion, I guess, of the kneecap. Um, they turned it over to the uh, Kent family. You know, as a mother, I don't think until you lose a child, you ever know the pain and the hurt that it is. When he'd murder these women, sometimes he would rape them before, but a lot of times, he would like to have sex with them after they were dead. So he was a he was a necrophile. But he never liked talking about that. 
Ted Bundy not only offered information on where investigators might find the victim's remains, but he also offered clues as to why they had trouble with certain kinds of evidence, such as the murder weapons. Ted didn't leave much of a trail behind. Went down the road, throwing everything that I had had, just tossing about the window and the crowbar, everything, handcuffs, everything. I gotta get mad at myself a few weeks later because I'd have to go out and buy another pair. I mean, it's not comical, but that's what would happen. In the end, it frustrated and irritated and probably even angered many of the law enforcement officials. At one point, it was, you're done. Started to prepare him for the execution. He was, uh, I think, quite terrified when he came in. He was puffing. Ted Bundy may finally die Tuesday morning after over 10 years on death row. Ted Bundy reached out to investigators in Colorado, Utah, and Washington State, offering them information on those open, unsolved cases as a bargaining chip trying to save his own life. Bundy confessed to around 20 murders. He was linked to dozens more. He confessed to killing people and didn't even know, didn't even know were dead. He confessed to killing some hitchhiker out in West and told them where the body was buried. And uh, they called local law enforcement and lo and behold, there was a body there. He was coming clean and um, he was also very tired. Ted was not the bold, uh, defiant uh, individual that we have observed on TV. He was a defeated person. Approximately an hour into the interview, he uh, began to break down and cry and uh, stated that he was sorry. I'm sorry, that doesn't care to think, but I understand that I'm not a son. I'm not my son. And I didn't understand that. The senselessness of it is, it, it, it appalls me, although I'm sure not as much as those who are so close to it. But he also threatened to withhold information. Bundy's uh, attorneys were notifying the parents that if we, we could write a letter to the governor and ask, like, for a stay, you know, of execution, he would tell everything. And I remember thinking if I do write to the governor, um, Bundy might lie about everything. For him to be negotiating for his life over the bodies of victims is despicable. The risk of that sort of a bargain with the devil, if you will, is that they're going to give you false information. They're going to send you on tangents. They're going to just mislead you in a hundred ways only so that they can benefit by postponing the inevitable, in his case, which was execution. I was hoping that it would create more time in Monday's mind, three months, six months. He just wanted to hold on to his life. That's all he had left was the bargain. He tried to blame it on pornography, for example. California religious broadcaster and psychologist Dr. James Dobson interviewed Bundy Monday afternoon. You were with Ted Bundy before he was uh, electrocuted by the state of Florida, were you not? I was. He wanted me to get have the last interview. What was that and, like? And he wanted to confess and uh, explain why he felt he got into trouble. And he wanted to talk about um, pornography and what it had done in his life. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, something which, which gives you a greater sense of, of, of excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography in the way so far. Pornography does a lot of negative things, especially to relationships and marriages. But one thing it doesn't do, it does not cause people to slaughter women and cut up their heads. Bundy is just trying to pass the blame on why he's the way he is. It's not going to make a bit of difference. Once you do confess to all those things, and it's, you know, it's hard to say, you know, Florida don't do this. On January 24th at 7 a.m., the death warrant will be in effect. You don't negotiate with a murder. Attorney General called and said, it's going to happen this time. Execution is, you know, going to happen. 
Ted Bundy sits in this wing of the Florida State Prison, 30 feet from the electric chair where he's scheduled to die. I had worked a long, hard time but seeing to it that he got executed, and seeing it through the end was attending his execution. Mike Vassalinder. We're supposed to be at the prison at 4 or 4.30. Uh, the van picked us up, they took us over. We were taken to the execution chamber. But for a glass wall, we could have reached out and touched him on the knee. We were, he was that close. And, you know, he was, uh, I think, quite terrified when he came in. He was puckered. They set him down in the chair and they started to prepare him for the execution. He looked more disoriented than defiant. He asked me and the minister to tell his family that he loved them. The beginning of the end for Ted Bundy came when the prison's generator was started to power the electric chair's 2,000 volts. The lights outside death row flickered and Bundy's life winked out. I'll tell you what I heard said when the execution was accomplished. That was too easy. They ought to bring him back and do it again 30 more times. That was too easy for what he had done. We got a call saying that, you know, it was over, that he had been electrocuted. And we knew before everyone on television. At uh, 7.16 this morning, the doctor at Florida State Prison pronounced Theodore Bundy dead. I cried, just wailed, and I think it was for Lisa and Margaret more than for me. You never, you know, get over that pain. You never get it. Healing is a huge process. Um, and a part of your heart is always um, broken. But yes, I think there was a sense that, you know, justice had been done. Ted has gotten just exactly what he deserved. If anybody ever fit the death penalty as such, uh, Ted Bundy did. Then a hearse carrying a metal pauper's coffin with Bundy's body inside left the prison. I was awake until he, until they drove, us, drove him out. I just, my start to cry and my nose, and it was just like my, I was relieved in such a sense that I could relax now after all these years. And on the, uh, across the street from the prison on the right, cheers went up and uh, people were celebrating. People were cheering for the execution of a person who had been denied the rights that our system guarantees and nobody cared. That was such a hard thing for us. So hard for us to say, you know, you need to die. But he had to be stopped. We knew that. I think if he wouldn't have been stopped, he'd have kept killing. The morning after the execution, the Seattle television station came and we did the interview. And towards the end, she said, I have Mrs. Bundy listening to you. Is there anything you want to say to her? In a quiet corner of the Lake City Cemetery lies a shy, sweet 12-year-old girl. Kim Leach was abducted from her school here almost 11 years ago. After Ted Bundy, there is a realization that uh, no matter where you live or who you are, you, know, you can be a victim. Bundy had beaten the electric chair for 10 years on death row until Tuesday. Peter Bundy was executed at 716 this morning in the electric chair at Florida State Prison. When Ted Bundy got executed, uh, I, as well as many others, thought, hooray, uh, he got what he deserved. The fact that he could kill these innocent young women just, see, is so far beyond even one's imagination. I think he got the justice that he deserved. Not that I'm advocating for the death penalty, but there didn't seem to be any alternative for someone who'd done such horrific things to so many people, and especially to my friend. A federal judge called Bundy the most competent serial killer in the country, a diabolical genius. A life of brutality, murder, and deceit. A life that ended this morning as an unsolved mystery. The morning after the execution, a Seattle television station came and we did the interview and towards the end she said I have Mrs. Bundy listening to you is there anything you want to say to her and I told her that we were so sorry that this had to happen and she talked back to me that I never wanted this to be true I just never thought it would be true he was our 
much beloved son and we can't we didn't raise him to be this kind of person she was hurting oh my goodness I had a daughter like Sue and I have all those golden memories and what did she have what did she take to her grave shame and disappointment guilt heartache we all share in the shame of Ted Bundy. Uh, Tacoma is the university district, uh, the east side of Lake Sammamish, where he conducted a couple of the murders. Olympia, Ellensburg, Utah, Colorado, Florida. I think there was a determination to not be a victim, to not let an individual try to strip you of that kind of future. I try not to ever let it define me, but it's still a part of me. There was nothing that he did that was going to stop any part of my life. I had too much to go for, too many things I wanted to do. I didn't want to be held back. You just got to keep going because there's going to be another hurdle in front of you and you can't let any one of them keep you down. Your best revenge is a life well lived, so go for it. Be your best self and make your life wonderful. I just want to be sure the women are not forgotten that did die. It's sad that they never had the opportunity to live their lives. My sister Sue, people knew her. When she was alive and, and pretty and healthy and that's what I want her to be remembered as. You don't ever put those you love out of your heart and your mind they're there I don't believe in the word closure for victims families there isn't any closure it's an open wound that scars over but it's there and she'll always be in our life Bundy took one final mystery to the grave with him why he became one of history's worst mass killers. What shocked Florida, what shocked the nation, was the boy next door was a monster. And nobody knew it. He told me that he was sick, that there was a force within him that he tried to fight and tried to contain, but that it just kept building and building, and it made him do the things that he did. I'm not sure exactly how many actually confessed to. The FBI has figured around 35. There is some hint that there might have been a lot more. To him, it's a big hunt and chase game. And the fear and the terror is overwhelmingly exciting. I guess it's uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That notion's been around for a long time. You've got a, a person who, on one moment, appears to be an affable, decent, intelligent fellow that you'd like to spend time with, and the next moment he's uh, severing some woman's head and visiting her dead body. And how do you put those things together? I hear Ted Bundy in so many different contexts. You do create uh, a media image of me uh, that's far beyond you know, the reality of me. I'm not going to try to please people or impress people because quite frankly the amount of bias and, and prejudice that surrounds me as, as a media image I can't begin to tear down. After admitting to 36 murders Ted Bundy's reign of terror ended with his execution on January 24th, 1989. His heartbroken mother, Louise, lived for another 22 years. She passed away in 2012. The identity of Ted's biological father has never been revealed. The Chi Omega sorority has created a scholarship fund in the name of fallen sisters Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy. Susan Rancourt's mother, Vivian, said her daughter was always smiling and kind to everyone. Susan's family has dedicated a memorial garden in her name at Central Washington University. I'm Hill Harper. Thanks for watching.